You better be listening to Slezoids or I must break you. Are you in contact with the subject? We're prepared to deliver Hiroshi Amori. The price of a hundred million dollars. And was soll ich dabei machen? Oh, nichts Besonderes. Das, was Sie früher schon für unsere Freunde gemacht haben. Werden Sie sich das Gesicht? Warum? Ich will es nie wieder sehen. Verstehen Sie? Und wenn ich es sympathisch finde? This is a defection, not a kidnapping. To business. Corporations are at war for tomorrow's technology. He's mutating a virus. Could cure the common cold. You know how many billions that's worth? Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films that we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise, and at the end of each episode along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. Next week, we are talking about our large lizard son, our large lizard friend. So please join the sleaze. We decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an on-air shout out in two bonus episodes every single month, which we have been doing for four and a half years, coming on five years. There's like um, probably like 120 bonus episodes as well as our bonus transmission series where we talk about new release genre films. So if you haven't made the jump yet, patreon.com slash Sleazoids podcast, we'd recommend doing that. And speaking of which, we do have our patrons uh, to shout out today. Uh, and they are loading here. We have <laughs> Tobias Holden who signed up. Uh, we have Alex Pittard. We have Alex M. Uh, we have Zombie Horde. Uh, <laughs> we had Dawson Martin. We had Bryn. We had Drew Hunter. And last but not least, we had Ryan O'Hara. So thanks so much to all of you folks for signing up and getting those bonus episodes. Hope you're enjoying them and we appreciate the support. Yeah, thank you. The other plug for the week, as always, is Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you are listening on either one of those platforms and I see the stats, I can see you right now listening on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Scroll down to the very bottom. Give us a good old rating and review on either one of those platforms. It helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners. Um, and the very last plug for the week, as always, is merch. If you like the poster art that based out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for the show, you can get that basically put on anything that you can think of. And you freaks have thought of a lot of things. You can just get a poster. You can get a hoodie, a shirt, a cup. Uh, I don't know, pens, notebooks, <laughs> pillows. I can't even list them all anymore. Uh, that link is in the description as well as over at sleezoidspodcast.com. But that is it for the intro. Welcome back to another week. As always, I am your host, Josh Lewis. And joining me also, as always, is my co-host, Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. I think if my uh, math is correct here, the uh, last time you folks would have heard from us would have been two weeks ago. And uh, we would have had very special guest, uh, Peter Koplowski, the Mm -hmm. uh, curator, programmer, writer and producer uh, on who uh, programs uh, most recently anyway uh, the Midnight Madness section at the Toronto International Film Festival which is the cult and action and genre and sci-fi section of the festival which uh, once again through the power of time travel I believe I am at right now uh, (laughs) while I'm recording this so I am already enjoying some of Peter's selections and uh, we had him on to give us a good old uh (laughs) at the canadian and midnight madness themed uh genre pairing he brought with him one the wrong guy from 1997 which was uh directed by uh, i think it was david steinberg who had directed episodes of seinfeld and curb your enthusiasm and it was written and starring uh dave foley who was a major member of kids in the hall which if anyone familiar with canadian sketch comedy uh, that is where that came from. And it was a very, very funny movie that I was surprised I hadn't seen. Um, so yeah, I'm very glad hilarious. that we talked about that. Yeah. It's in- incredible genre parody of like Hitchcock films and, you know, just all, and, and half the movie turns into like, it's a wonderful life for a little while, but instead <laughs> of, uh, you know, it's, it's about the, uh, the poor lonely bankers who are rising up against the, uh, the very, Those uh, damn farmers, 
the farmers who are just, uh, you know, leaning on them and trying to trying to take them out. And then we paired that with a film called Mute Witness from 19. 19- 95 which was a uh sort of cat and mouse thriller that was i think shot in russia but it was like a german production and made by an american and starring it's a very uh very crazy production history we went through with peter talking about that but once again a very underseen and very underrated um little thriller about a uh woman who is mute and is a special effects artist sort of brian de palma's blowout style and she happens to uh witness a uh, snuff film being made after hours on the set she's working on and she has to try and escape so we talked uh, very underseen and very uh undervalued 90s thrillers about people who witness a murder check that out that was two weeks ago over on the main feed and last week over on the Patreon feed for the exclusive listeners over there to kind of prepare us for this week's episode, which we'll have the guests introduce. Uh, Jamie and I finally had to do it. We had to go cyberpunk mode. We've kind of, we've danced around it a little bit. You know, we've talked about films like Johnny Mnemonic. We've talked about films like The Matrix, but we had never talked about the big one. Ridley Scott, Harrison Ford, Philip K. Dick, Blade Runner, 1982. Uh, we finally did it. It was a monster episode, you know, and it was it was inspired by what we're going to be talking about this week, which is also what inspired the pairing, which for last week was another 1982 film. But on the much smaller end of the production scale, I will say uh, we talked about <laughs> Liquid Sky, uh, which was just, you know, a full on, you know, punk counterculture sci-fi thing but without any of the uh sort of amazing uh i guess what you would say expensive production design uh and definitely (laughs) done with just a lot more attitude and a lot more sort of limited invention but still a really cool film to talk about so you haven't heard that episode over on the main feed last week blade runner and liquid sky and that episode uh actually basically set us up uh perfectly for what we're going to be doing to today and we have two special guests joining us one is a returning guest who has since uh started his own online magazine called blood knife and we also have a uh, longtime listener patron and supporter of the show who's getting his knighthood upgrade to friend of the pod status this week. They have since started doing uh, podcasts together over at one. The parents just don't understand, which is a a podcast that I've guested on before. And I think both become regular co-hosts over on Podside Picnic, which is the sci-fi show that Jamie and I both actually once guested on together to talk about. I am legend. But those uh, guests are Kurt (laughs) Schiller and Chris Woodward. How are you guys doing? Hey, Hey, honored to be here. I'm, I'm I'm glad to be earning my wings. That's right. Yeah, I'm 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 doing really good, and, and uh, I'm psyched to be back. It was a good time last time, and I'm I'm really looking forward to these weird ass films. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for for um, joining us, and uh, you know, as being previous guests and for being listeners of the show, I'm sure both of you know you know the drill. We have the guests bring on the double feature with them. So what two films have you brought with you this week and why did you pair them together? Uh, the films for this week are uh, Decoder from 1984, uh, directed by M- Musha, Muska, I think Musha, uh, and uh, the 1998 Abel Ferrara film New Rose Hotel, which is an adaptation of the William Gibson cyberpunk uh, novel, or uh, short story, rather, of the same name. And uh, I, they're, they're both uh, really strongly cyberpunk, but, but heavier on the punk than the cyber, and I'd say they're both uh, polarizing and off-putting films. <laughs> <laughs> and I've said it better. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's definitely a a, a a way to describe that. And it was funny we we had uh, both of these films basically lined up for potential double features, which is what happened for last week's episode. Because basically, I think the way that I had them slotted in for eventual uh, play was Blade Runner and New Rose Hotel and um, Liquid Sky Ooh, yeah. and Decoder. So I think that those were like the episodes that I had looked at. So then you guys chose two of them. And then I went, well, do you know what we were going to do? You know, let's just so we did the A pictures first. You know, we just <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. we did Blade mm-hmm. Runner yeah. and Liquid Sky together and now we're ready to talk about them. But is there any order that you guys want to talk about these ones in? 
I don't have a strong opinion. My my inclination is usually to say talk about the less weird one yeah. uh, first, which I, <laughs> I guess is New Rose Hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, the, it, it is funny because like we're 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 going to be operating with a double feature here, where New Rose Hotel is probably the more accessible and probably like the <laughs> the, the A picture typically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is bizarre because in the career of Abel Ferreira, that's absolutely not true. It is actually one of his more, you know, uh, off putting and uh, more disrespected films, I would say, um, despite being, I think, one of his strongest. But I, mm-hmm. I kind of agree. I think we should break the chronological thing uh, here and we should start with uh, New Rose Hotel. But, yeah, we are going very low fi textured cyberpunk mode. This week, following up our discussion of uh, full on cyberpunk from from last week, which we'll recap a little bit as we get into and we start talking about, uh, I'm sure, Gibson and and Neuromancer and and everything like that as well. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I think we'll jump right into it here. Let's start off with New Rose Hotel. When love is a weapon. We're no closer to pulling this off than the first time you thought of it. Trust can be fatal. What happened to the girl? The girl is vanished. The money's gone. They deny we had an account. They're gonna come after us, you know that. I've been hunted my whole life. It's all I know. I think about it. Good. Time's up. Do it. I wish you had. New Rose Hotel. All right, we are talking New Rose Hotel, the 1998 American uh, erotic cyberpunk drama (laughs) film (laughs) co-written and directed by Abel Frera and, as mentioned at the top of the show, based on the William Gibson short story of the same name. Now, this is, you know, Abel Frera, kind of a god of of the show at this point. I don't know how many films Mm -hmm. we've covered, but it's been a lot. But for anyone unfamiliar with Abel Frera in the 70s and 80s, he was a very guerrilla New York transgressive genre filmmaker. Things like Driller Killer, Miss 45. You can find episodes uh, of us talking about both of these films very early on. Very cheap, ugly, gruesome, basically angry gutter slashers almost that took on ideas of artistic and economic frustration and sexual assault and psychic breakdown and kind of layered all of these experiences together with the grime of someone who actually knew what it was like to be a drug addict and living on the streets of New York. Um, mm-hmm. but, but by the time he hit the 90s uh he was actually getting budgets and he was working with studios he was working with major actors he had people like harvey keitel in his films he had christopher walken he was doing things like king of new york and bad lieutenant and the gangster film even the funeral which we actually covered with uh with rob franco which had a you know even you know uh, more actors than just that and He still maintained, I would say, while operating in crime and gangster and sort of cop movies with the level of psychological intensity and kind of very, very lonely, uh, self-destructive Catholic guilt, I think, which kind of become (laughs) a bit of his staple and also looked at, you know, systems of power and violent impulse and, you know, forces and money and how all these things are tied together. But this was also around the time that he was doing stuff like he did a body snatcher remake that most people don't know about around this time. Yes, that's good. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, and then uh, but but eventually I think those basically stopped making money and it was it was getting to the point where, you know, like King of New York is probably considered his most like stylish commercial film in a way. We're going to be talking about moving into the late 90s where he was making things like the blackout, making films like the addiction, which is something where <laughs> we covered, which is his vampirism as drug addiction film, which is almost basically like a rom- like almost goes Romero style in terms of how it mm-hmm. gets into like ideas of AIDS and genocide and mortality. And this was his return to much weirder, cheaper, more limited territory. Um, and also included, you know, like for example, but still, you know, very transgressive, like Lily Taylor in that film, there's a part where she shoots, uh, blood into her veins, like it's heroin, which is like an image that only Abel Ferrer would have, uh, would have come up with. Um, and so now moving into new Rose hotel, this is his attempt at what is a, uh, (laughs) cyberpunk, like corporate espionage thriller. And I just want to say up front, that's not the experience of watching this film. Listing those genres side by side together is not actually the experience of watching um, 
this this film, which is based on the sci fi author William Gibson's 1980 short story, uh, which basically floated around for almost a decade. It was almost made by Catherine Bigelow at one point, and it eventually landed into the hands of Zoe Lund, who we've talked about a couple times because she was the star of Miss 45 and special effects with Larry Cohen. And she was the co-writer on Bad Lieutenant with Abel Ferreira. So apparently she is who got Ferreira interested by writing a draft of the screenplay. Um, which I think you can definitely feel in the Asia Argento character. That feels like a character that Zoe Lund at one point maybe would have considered playing herself. Um, but and maybe a good place to start would be talking, I think, maybe a little bit about uh, Gibson. What is your guys' relationship to William Gibson? I think you guys might be more familiar with him as an author than we are. Yeah, so he he was one of the you know fathers of the cyberpunk genre in general with uh particularly with neuromancer was the big book that really uh, uh started it all with him and him and uh, bruce sterling was also a big figure in this which is kind of taking like that 80s um you know the this the fir uh, first burgeoning of at home computers and things like that um and combining it with um uh, kind of like war esque stories um, mm -hmm. and um, setting them, you know, in, in a future. Uh, Neuromancer particularly takes, uh, is dealing with, like, um, artificial intelligence and, and things on, on those lines. Hmm. What's, what, what's interesting, and I think is really relevant to this film, um, which, by, by the way, I love, uh, is, and, and I, I think that this probably helps explain kind of part of why the film is the way it is, is um, in, in, in Gibson's, like, early writing, of, of, of which uh, New Rose Hotel is an, is an earlier short story than Neuromancer, um, it came out in this short story collection called Burning Chrome. I think came out like two or three years before N Neuromancer. Uh, Johnny Mnemonic was also in in that that same collection. Right. And that that was that was arguably like like the big story that was in it. Um, and Johnny Mnemonic is in the same setting as Neuromancer and reuses some of the same characters. But um, there's a lot less emphasis on technology in the stories that are in in Burning Chrome. And like when people think of like William Gibson Neuromancer, they tend to think like cyborgs, artificial intelligence um mm -hmm. but a lot of william gibson's focus has real has always been on the technology as aesthetic and not so much the technology as like sci-fi concept right and what's interesting is if you read interviews with abel ferrara about new rose hotel he really gets it like he clearly knows a lot about william gibson um like he he talked to him a couple times door while making it which he says was like funny but not actually useful but he he's, <laughs> he's like he he clearly thought this through and came up with what he thought was like a very intentional way to approach it he didn't just kind of like you know flippantly adapt something that he didn't care about um and there's a there's actually there's a really interesting quote from a 1998 interview with uh with indiewire where they're asking Ferrara about like you know like how was how was this hard to adapt? And he basically says, well, wh why would it be hard? And the interviewer says, well, you know, there's all the cyber lingo and all this like high technology. And uh, his response is, there's none of it in there. It's all bullshit. It's not in there. Uh, people <laughs> misunderstand it. It's just about corporations. There's no cyber anything. Mm. It's just about big corporations and how that's alienating. And I think he's right. Yeah. I think he's exactly right. And everyone else has misunderstood a lot of the short story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think um, corporatism uh, is a big thing in a lot in like a lot of Gibson's writings, uh, even up to the present day with like the Blue Ant trilogy and things like that. Uh, where, um, and, and I think that kind of spawns from the 80s where there was this um, kind of, you know, obviously you know, neoliberalism was coming into its, like, uh, own uh, right then, and, you know, Reagan was, like, you know, really kicking uh, capitalism, you know, like a rocket off off the ground. And uh, so the result, but combining that with, um, there's, there's kind of like a weird... Um, or orientalism to some cyberpunk and i think that comes from the fear of like japanese corporations particularly um and which is very evident in new rose hotel with like that the hosaka mm -hmm. uh company um and the 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 figure uh, of the 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 scientist being um japanese as well um so i i think it's all that kind of stuff mixed together um that makes that lends to this story which uh, you, you know, as you said, it doesn't have a lot of the like the stuff that you the, the genres you would use to describe it basically happen off screen. And we're just seeing the, the parts in between. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the coolest parts, because when you talk cyberpunk, like immediately, I think people's minds, regardless of, you know, sort of history or context, they immediately jumped, obviously, things like Blade Runner, which we covered last week. And then they, you know, they jumped to things, you know, in, in comics, like things like Judge Dredd or maybe like Akira for early examples. They jump to, you know, Philip K. Dick, J.G. Ballard, like the idea yeah, is sort of just like a giant gun and a like a. Like some type of eye technology <laughs> that, you know, zooms in for you and like analyzes somebody you're looking at or something like that. That's I think a lot of the time that's the image that comes to mind. Yeah. And, and yeah, and, and you get these sort of vast ideas of the societal collapse and the decay of sort of industrial capital. And you get this, you know, and, and merging it with the the burgeoning developments of, you know, the specifics of things like artificial intelligence and cybernetics. And you get into Johnny Mnemonic and you get into more of like the hacker culture and the punk, punk culture mm, and, telepathic you know, and, and, and a lot of a lot of those <laughs> authors um, were interested in like Cronenberg uh, you know, like the effect that technology and machines were having on the human experience and done in this very hard boiled noir street grime character sensibility. But then the high tech information age imagery, I think, is what most people kind of mm-hmm. think about. And we, we talked about Philip K. Dick's um, sort of uh, big quote that I think kind of summarized what it was that he was interested in because he did this great speech that most people, I think, don't don't know that much about but if you can find it you should look it up he did a great speech at the university of vancouver where he basically talked through writing uh do androids dream of electric sheep and he talked about this idea of you know this that our environment and our world of man-made machines and artificial constructs and computers and all of this that it is starting to possess you know animation in a very real sense, the environment is becoming alive or quasi alive and in ways that are, you know, comparable to the human experience and that by studying, uh, not necessarily, you don't have to study machines, but you could actually study ourselves and find out what it is that machines are doing, what our constructs are up to. And a lot of his cyberpunk stories basically came from that idea. And what's interesting about New Rose Hotel and what Gibson is doing here and what Ferreira seemed to so deeply understand is that that doesn't necessarily mean that you need like this high tech gadget in order to like, he doesn't literally like, like this, this is, I think the clearest expression of that in the sense that he is literally looking at human psyche and human feeling and human emotion first, and then being like, how do these things branch off from that? How did we get here from those places? So yeah, as a result, uh, new Rose hotel, maybe controversially to a lot of people, it's incredibly stripped down and incredibly nondescript and it underplays its noir elements. It's not like a particular, I mean, it is to me a beautiful looking film, but it is not a particularly like sleek or like fabulous or expensive looking no, film. No, like, like right. all of its, its version of the future is just this bland corporatized, like present reality that we would have already been living in, in 1998. But he's like, what if that was taken to its extreme and everything was flatter? Like even the lighting setups at times, mm-hmm. like what if every, what if your entire world was just a series of like, office rooms and like yeah, hotel like staircases <laughs> sometimes <laughs> like uh, yeah it all looks like dying malls to me yes yeah. like exactly like, I, I i wrote an article um for uh an npr affiliate here in philly a few weeks ago of, about like dying malls in the area and um as as i was kind of going and visiting a bunch of different ones i i started thinking about this movie and like because they have that weird kind of like shabby like this used to be nice like you you, you can <laughs> feel that when it was built uh, which wasn't even that long ago it <laughs> was nice and now it seems kind of pathetic and i think what's nice about that in terms of the film is that it it makes it makes the characters of like Fox and X so deeply uncool. Like they're not like cool operators. They always kind of seem a little bit like they don't really have their shit together because they're not, they don't look cool to us. They don't have cool cyber gadgets and shit. They seem, they don't get like, like an amazing action yeah. set piece where they show off their skills or anything like all exactly. like th- that might even happen in this story, but it happens off screen deliberately. Right. Yes. Yeah. I also Which is, I think, like that, the coolest element. Yeah, I also find the way they incorporate technology in this is like it, it, it's never really focused on. I mean, they have a couple things where it seems like 
you know, certain things are kind of like projected uh, that make it look a little futuristic, like when they're looking through passports or documents or things like that. But it's never to the level of, uh, let's say, like Blade Runner, for instance, when, you know, Deckard is going through the pictures <laughs> and like enhance yeah. and like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it it yeah. doesn't really happen. And a lot of it, too, is uh, done through like you see quite a bit of footage through surveillance cameras. Um, yes. And I think even the start of the, the movie, it looks like it has almost digital photography and it's very um, like almost pixelated and it's moving in slow motion. Um, yeah. They, they like remove frames or something from mm-hmm. it. So it kind of like skips a little bit. It's very strange looking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, and it's not to say though that, you know, I mean, it is walking and Defoe. So, you know, walking especially has just like a, a, a swagger to him. So there is still kind of like, you know, he, he's got the cane and he's dancing at the club. Some of these line deliveries, that. which I'm sure we'll get to are just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So the so, hair so, on a snatch. <laughs> <laughs> a battleship. <laughs> Yeah, so like there there is there is still kind of a I agree I agree that they don't have that like typical cool guy cyberpunk aesthetic or anything like that. There's there's still a little bit of charisma I think that goes along with their characters and just because they have to do that for their their job, you know, a lot of it just is is mostly convincing people to do things. Um so th- so mm-hmm. they do have that, but it is a lot less um of a spectacle. Uh, than I anticipated when I went into this because it's the first yeah, time there, there, there's not really thing. a tactical thrill to this story despite like the yeah. clear jobs that these guys have which are like clearly intensely thrilling like you like the opening moments that Jamie was referring to where they have like the sort of like schooly D sort of hip hop influenced electric guitar sounds mm-hmm. over those distorted hazy images and what's happening is Defoe is actually watching an attempted extraction or kidnapping gone wrong in Tokyo very violently that we later find out was like a corporate false flag attack on like its <laughs> yeah. own crew members, which is just, you know, the, the inscrutable nature of who's planning who and, you know, becomes kind of built into the text a little bit in an interesting way. Yeah. But like very clear, the danger of this world is solidified in the the opening sequence of like what this corporate world looks like and how international and you don't know who your enemy is. Like even the credits of the film itself are done in German, Japanese and English uh, for all three <laughs> markets. And we understand that in as we hear one of the characters say to another one, there's a full scale subterranean war being waged for every shred of information. Corporate suits killing each other off by the thousands each year. It's the Holocaust of the 21st century and everybody knows about it and nobody is like saying anything about it. And I think Walken just goes potato, potato, government corporation, (laughs) you know, like this is the kind of attitude he has about it. Yeah. Um, And for anyone who hasn't seen it, like the overall sort of, you know, uh, motion of the film where it's set in this world where the corporations are more powerful than states. And, which is just true. <laughs> and, yeah. the, the, and the sort of capital competition for intellectual property that's generated by the employees is like the ultimate form of, you know, this financial network. So it, it has now generated this industry of paid agents played by in the film Defoe and Walken, who are Fox and X, who perform essentially this modern form of corporate espionage that involves um basically trading in human lives, like taking these guys who are geniuses or scientists or, you know, uh, you know, p- people who just work for corporations. Like there's no such thing as a like contract. It is kind of like, can you literally kidnap a dude and force him to work for a different company? And, and they call it like <laughs> defecting and extraction and everything like that. But it is incredibly violent and they are extraction specialists, basically partially headhunters, partially, you know, these violent kidnappers who are moving uh, one scientist, this man named Hiroshi uh, Arumi from a corporation called Maz and moving it to a different corporation called Hasaka. And that is basically the entire story. Um, and there's a little bit of this element where, you know, obviously they they also meet this girl 
named Sandy, played by Asia Argento, the daughter of uh, Dario Argento, the famous Italian horror filmmaker, obviously. And she is a prostitute or a Shinjuku girl, as they refer to her as. And they hire her to act as a sort of romantic seductress to bring real mm-hmm. human feeling and passion sort of back into this transactional equation of how are they going to move this guy? Well, what moves a guy more than a pretty lady uh, kissing? <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. over him um, and, and the and the new rose hotel is uh the name of basically just a rundown capsule hotel that defoe uh will get to by the end of the film eventually makes his way to and retreats to but that is loosely what new rose hotel the structure of it but the um, and it sounds really simple and it is really simple yeah. but there is a lot of really complicated detail to the way that Frere I think has structured this and the way that the especially the actors perform it mm-hmm. definitely yeah, it's it's very focused on like the business entanglements of yeah. these characters who like don't work like they're like they're independents so they are you know they're temporarily working for Hosaka uh, but they kind of have to negotiate like the con there's like, I love the meeting where they meet with Hosaka and it's kind of like, it's, 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 it's this very like intentional depiction of like business. Like we need to put on like our business face and like go into this and convince them. And like, they're, they don't really have a side. It's very tenuous. They're very concerned with like how they're appearing to who and what they know about, mm-hmm. about different people. And it, it gives, it gives the, the film this whole sense of like, everything could fall away at it, at any moment and what i love about it is that you think you come to grips with that and then it really like pulls the rug out from under you of like oh there's actually a whole other level of deception and the people that you thought were successfully deceiving people actually were like they they didn't know a single fucking thing about what was going on mm-hmm. um and what, what I love about it is that it's not really, it's not even really like, like a, like, it's not even like, like, like a twist. It just removes the agency from the characters. And you realize that like, like the plot that you were watching wasn't even like, it, it was the plot for those characters, but it wasn't really the story that was going on. And I, I love that extra level of artifice. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just, re- it's really fun. Yeah. With, um, even with the way they portray Hiroshi, like, I don't think I could be wrong, but I don't think there's one scene where you actually get to you know, really speak with him or, or hear him talk. He's, he's always portrayed just looking incredibly lonely and sad. Um, he, he's always portrayed through surveillance. There's just this, this separation from like the, the job even that they're, that they're going to do. Um, the, it, it feels so impersonal. In fact, the, the only, I guess there's two relationships that feel more personal. The one with Fox and uh, X actually feels like, they have they've at least developed some type of uh, friendship or relationship. Um, and then, of course, there's there's X and uh, Sandy. Um, but but even with the job itself, like, you know, we just we never really see Hiroshi interact with anybody. It's just this kind of like th- this this person that they just yeah. need to take over kidnapped well he's treated like the... a like a like a like a prized cattle mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good way to yeah, put it I, yeah i mean at, at one point i i think <clears throat> christopher walken as fox uh says something like uh you know we used to just steal secrets and then eventually every company could just make whatever we uh you know make better and stuff of the things that we steal so now we're just stealing people so they're you know they're it's it's just like the you know leveling up uh, uh, on the thing so it's not so much of like oh we care about this person and we wanted to give them a better life it's like mm-hmm. yeah the company wants them and you know it's rather than getting some blueprints we're gonna get them this guy who can make the blueprint yeah the edge he's got this great speech about the edge where he talks about how like you know people it used to be people who were willing to to walk 3,000 miles to the north pole or something like that and he's like <laughs> now it's just it's it's just a really smart guy who will very momentarily give one of these corporations the like the 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 edge the the mm-hmm. ultimate virtue is the ability to do what you intended to like like what you s- set out intending to do and that's it it's just a little it's just a little tiny crumb but it's 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 enough and they're like they're like crumb gatherers <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, well, well, and my, my favorite aspect of this is that, like, what we're describing is that these characters obviously operate in a heavily corporatized world, one that has reduced human connection to transactions. And we've seen a lot of that in the way that characters are treated just like like objects. Like, literally, we will just go steal a guy and bring him to another company, and now he has to work for that guy. And, and even the, the way relationships that- with, like, women and stuff. I mean, it's either they're, they're doing either, like, corporate espionage, which is very cold, or they're in brothels where they're just purchasing purchasing girls like there, there's no or, or, real... or doing the sex performance art or yeah, yeah. exactly like it's it's yeah. very and, and even then that stuff is captured in like these hazy video images that like create a distance between you and them mm-hmm. and the sex stuff is like it is i would say it's just it's not the most particularly like erotic thing that's ever been shot except for <laughs> you know the, the, the stuff with argento and defoe i think it's a little bit uh, more yeah. in that direction but like there's more you know, humanity the, in that <laughs> Yeah, there's more actual genuine passion or or feigned passion or, or the so illusion you think, of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but a lot of this is again, it's like bank account numbers and screens and cityscapes and hotel rooms and you know, it's a very minimalist lo fi vision of what cyberpunk is and mm-hmm. very mundane. Um, but my favorite aspect of this is how like it's subjectively, you know, stylized to get at that this this world feels unnatural that the characters mm-hmm. they yearn for something beyond that like the actual style is very dreamy and very musical like it's lots of you know re, you know there's some intense lighting at times during the actual like musical sequences there's a lot of use of crossfades and like these yes. sort of strange fragmented compositions and 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 stuff and i i like that like basically right off the bat you can tell that these characters, you know, they they want something else. The camera floats along like seductively over the club performances and they t- the, the girl is singing about falling in love without falling in love. And you get like this almost like Terrence Malick free form spontaneity mm-hmm. as like Defoe mm-hmm. is having like a threesome with two girls in the club and walk in who's playing Fox. He, you know, he's discussing this new job and how on the last job, by the way, he got his back broken and is walking around with a cane, just lending itself to the idea that these aren't like the coolest, most, uh, most action heavy, uh, you know, characters. Um, and yeah, he's, he feels old and sick and horny and he just gets completely entranced by, uh, Asia Argento, who is playing Sandy, who is this black haired Italian club singer who sings the song that goes, you know that I love you so and that I die for you. Um, Don't kill me, baby, is what she says. Mm -hmm. Um, And it results in Defoe, who's playing X, kind of taking her up to the to the, you know, the all white hotel room for the night. They're lounging in the bathrobes and he's got the suit on her smoking and the tight red dress that she has on the the huge close up of the tattoo on her belly. Like this is the thing about the Asia Argento, I think, performance and character. And you can where I think that you get the most sort of Zoe Lund kind of quality to it is that um she is just like a destabilizing force on screen and like a presence in terms of how Mm. just unbalanced one unbalanced her performance can be at times, which is something that I think people didn't like when they first watched it in 1998. I know this was a critical disaster for Ferreira. Um, (laughs) I feel like I do think that it's too though, just because like she's trying to play a part that she's not used to like that scene where um, Fox and and her are trying like kind of role playing about how she would go about convincing Hiroshi to to you know run away with her and all of that. She she does kind of have this in that moment at least a very unnatural uh, acting presence. Um, and I don't think that like I think most of the film she's actually quite good. But in that scene, it does feel like she's channeling something that she's as a character is not used to doing um, and really mm-hmm. has to put on this performance that is very unnatural to her. Well, and, and how dominating she can be also just in the scenes, in the way that Frere is like, he can't, Frere mm. can't stop shooting her. Like the camera <laughs> is dr- like, she's like a gravitational <laughs> pull. Yeah. Anytime she's doing something like she's flaunting, you know, in her lingerie around the hotel room, or there's even this great shot of Willem Dafoe, just like sitting on the hotel bed, listening to Christopher Walken's plan. Mm-hmm. And there, and in the shot, are just are her legs and her heels in the pillow yes. next to him laying on the opposite side. Like she just, she is always there. She is, there's just something so sort of magnetic about 
her on screen and she ends up by the end of the film an actual force of domination that makes those Mm -hmm. the way that the camera treats her make a lot more sense the way that she's slipping into the roles and Mm -hmm. she's bending it to her needs a little bit and becomes like this very so such a disruptive character that she ends up basically haunting the rest of the film Mm -hmm. and making the last 20 minutes this insane like (laughs) remix of everything that we've seen where you know Defoe is just replaying it's so electrified by the memories of her in her absence that she just completely undoes the film and I will say that Argento I think, you know, does a pretty good job of being that kind of force, despite the fact (laughs) that, you know, I think some people looked at her and they were like, oh, she feels a little unnatural or she feels like, you know, she's maybe putting on a performance. And I was like, guess what? Watch the rest of the film. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing that's like, when he recontextualizes it in his mind, he starts to, you know, question mm -hmm. every little thing, even the the moments that you felt were completely genuine and may have been, you know, you don't know really. Um, like when she says, like, you know, I want to marry you, have a family and he's looking back on it like, OK, but what about this other thing that she said? And and like, you know, the, the memories just become kind of distorted and uh, um, it, it's like he can't trust them any longer. Um, and I think that her s- strange, but I think really well done performance really works with that. So there's a funny bit of metafiction going on, too, where um, so eight. Uh, uh, F- Ferrara and Argento made a mini documentary while making mm-hmm. the film called Able Heart uh, Asia, I believe, or maybe it's Asia Heart Able. Um, and they they were they were dating either during the production or shortly thereafter, I believe. Um, and uh, was apparently, I mean, they 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 both seem like pretty tempestuous people, so it was <laughs> you know understandably tempestuous. I haven't watched the documentary, but apparently it's less of a documentary and more of just like two people hanging out, like fl- flirting constantly mm. and being high in like uh, hotel rooms. But um, it's 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 interesting to think of that in the context of like how the film was was made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well uh, I but, mean, but, yeah, I think it the, works oh. because he it, it feels like Ferreira and it sounds like Ferreira goes through the actual subjective experience yeah. that the ex character goes through in this film, oh, yeah. which yeah. is that he just becomes completely entranced by her to the point that he can't like see anything else. Like he's currently yeah. on a mission to snag this very high profile scientist who they call a renegade arrogant freak who's shattered the entire field that he's in and every concept of you know that he's brought forward about math and science he delivers with a violent revision and they've pursued this guy for a year and they are you know about to make the biggest they'll never have to work again it's they're gonna make like a hundred million dollars off of this transaction and yeah. Defoe just can't help but be jealous of the fact that the girl that he is teaching to seduce the scientist Mm-hmm. is give is is giving a blowjob to him like that just freaks him out he's like what this doesn't he's like this doesn't compute i'm completely in love with this woman it totally like destroys him even though they know up front what it is that they're doing like like yep. it, it's crazy how f- laid out the plan of what they're going to do is like that scene where walk in just straight up goes, you know, you know, you, you, what do you think about big bucks, baby? I think is what he <laughs> says. <laughs> and yeah, um, I love walking in every scene of this. Film. Oh, he awesome. has yeah. some just incredible, incredible line deliveries because he's looking at how trashy she is or how trashy she appears. And he's like, you know, she's got the tattoo on her belly that goes with her cheap shoes. He says, she's perfect. You know, yeah. you, you, I, and what is he, the line he gets is you said they got her, Hiroshi tighter than a crab's ass. Well, we got the <laughs> lubrication. It's elegant. <laughs> it's simple. And it's so corny that it can't miss. We have the beautiful temptress seduces, induces wild, crazy egghead scientists to drop his humdrum life and spend the rest of his days doing hot research and hot nookie. <laughs> which is the exact way that he describes this. And, and this is like in the first, like, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of, of the movie. So they immediately go, we are going to teach you how to, you know, feed on this guy's horniness and bring your intellect and your emotions into this so that, you know, we can, uh, we, we can, you, we can get that edge, the human hotspot and yeah. the, <laughs> uh, and, and he, he straight up says like, look, if you believe that you are falling in love with him, then he will believe it. And that is all that you need to do. You know how to make believe, you know how to make a man fall in love with you. It's a show. 
And, you know, that ultimately becomes, you know, the sort of framework of this entire thing is that Asia Argento in the way that her relationship with Ferreira and the sort of metafiction quality we have, she puts on a fucking show. And that is, you know, that's what and it's gorgeous and it's beautiful. And I think that's the craziest part is that you look at this story and you look how we've described it. And so much of this film wants to be romantic, which is, I think, the most deliberately you know, for some people, I think frustrating or simple part of the film. But for me, it's the part that just absolutely deepens it. Like the fact that yeah. when he, when Defoe is looking out at that balcony and he knows that this girl has got to go basically operate. He just watched a porn video of Hiroshi and he knows that he's sending this girl that he's interested in to be in one of these porn videos. And Walken is showing him the porn video and he's like Technicolor 3D Cinerama, you know, like 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 <laughs> they are so clearly using her as this cynical functional sex tool Mm -hmm. but he will literally leave that conversation and you'll get that shot of her standing out on the balcony at night completely silhouetted by the you know sort of like the the lights coming from the skyscrapers behind her and the embers of her cigarette as she's smoking there as Defoe like walks out to her just like, you know, it's it's so beautiful and it's so, you know, it's the kind of thing that, you know, the entire world disappears except for these two characters and their passions, uh, despite the actual very, very, you know, transactional context that we've seen them operating in. Yeah. I, well, and I, I think um, part of what makes the, you know, the final ill uh, to, to X and Fox so devastating is that they've kind of realized then how much they've been underestimating her the entire time because mm-hmm. of that tra- you know outwardly trashy appearance or you know how how much she is a commodity to them mm-hmm. uh, and, and as you said Josh a, a tool like and because like I'm trying to think I, I don't think there's any woman in this movie who is not commodified in some way because there's right. mm-hmm. uh, you know she, Sandy is used as this like you know the the honeypot essentially. Um, there's uh, Annabella uh, Siora or Skiora as uh, Madame Rosa, who like is basically like he's like gives the uh, X and Fox the lead, things like that. Um, and and then there's all you know everybody else is just maybe just prostitutes and things like that. So they, there's not a single non commodified woman in here. So no wonder that uh, they they kind of just assume that they they are in control of the situation yeah. and these people are just you know going to play to their tune and and you know. She, she wises up and is like, "Oh, well, you're teaching me how to how to uh, and look like I'm falling in love." Well, she's just going to do it right back at you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that's really uh, that that's really heightened by the. The, the fact that the the movie basically keeps you with blinders on the entire time like we were talking about before like this is this this happens uh, in, in a way it almost reminds you of something like uh, like a Glenn Glary Glenn Ross right there's these huge things moving around off scene like off screen but you're you're only seeing things happening in like one room and it's just mm-hmm. people experiencing a story that's happening elsewhere while confined to this room and you the audience are, are kind of in there confined with them the only information you get is these little close in scenes with this small number of characters there's no there's there's no big exposition just occasionally they'll get like a phone call maybe they have one business meeting and everything is very guarded like at the end of the film you don't even know who the players were you don't really know what ultimately happened you don't know who screwed them you don't know you know was she working for, like who, who was she working for was it Osaka? was it someone else like yeah you, she actually you, you tells really them multiple get... different backstories so it's deliberately yep. left ambiguous as to because i think she mentions at one point that her father might have worked for Osaka, but then she makes up a different backstory later Mm-hmm, you know, right. and and it happens during Defoe's sort of big recontextualization montage that kind of ends the film, which is, uh, by the way, a huge, like insane thing to include in a movie that it's, like yeah, <laughs> it's basically rewatching the film in like 20 minutes or something like yes. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the 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 reason that it's filmed like that is because the original story uh, is entirely told in flashbacks, and mm. it starts with um, X in the hotel, mm. basically. N- like, and he tells you up front, like, "I've been screwed, I've been burned," and then you gradually find out through flashbacks how that happened. In that same interview with IndieWire that I mentioned, uh, Ferrara basically says, "Like, I hate flashbacks; they're stupid because <laughs> then there's no tension." So the first thing that I had to do was untangle the story from flashbacks and just tell it 
straightforward until we get to the big double cross. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, is an absolute flex in terms of filmmaking of like, here, whoa, watch the film again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, yeah, well, well, I think by the end, like I felt unless I missed a, a couple pieces of, of dialogue here and there, but it, it almost felt like he, he's completely uncertain. I, it, it feels as if he still has this lingering feeling that the love could have been real. And we don't know if she has just completely left, if she's been killed, if she's been kidnapped. Yeah, she could have died. Yeah. yeah. He, so, so he's left with literally no answers rather than just like even feeling betrayed, I feel like would be at least an answer, something that he could latch on to and, and then move forward with. But he's just left in this this hotel capsule going was the love of my life real? Was this a dream? Was this anything? Um, and I think yeah. that's the most painful part of it. And he yeah. loses his, his, his business partner, which we will also get to. And like Fox has this, uh, this strange personality about him where it, the, every single scene, because it's got that walking uh, charisma, he feels incredibly confident. He feels almost happy to be where he's at. Whereas X like feels like, you know he's he's happy here and there. I think he's enjoying himself when he's with four naked women. It seems like, <laughs> but um, it, it it seems as if he's also thinking about something deeper. Whereas Fox seems totally comfortable in this environment, and and it might be a facade. You mm-hmm. don't really find out, to be honest. But um, I, I found that really well. He definitely about gives up a lot easier than X does. Yeah, That's true. Yeah, <laughs> and he also, if I'm not mistaken, he like as he's going to kill himself uh he 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 lets out like a woo as if he's enjoying <laughs> yeah. himself even in that moment so it's like his confidence he, never leaves him <laughs> he thought he was in the weapon of choice video and he was just he was just gonna like fly around you know after he jumped off the balcony <laughs> yeah exactly he's all he's often dressed in that kind of like grayish suit. <laughs> yeah he really, really is yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're definitely experiencing two different movies. Like, like mm. X is definitely this character who's found himself in more of like this lady from Shanghai or Vertigo style, like falling in love with an illusion type sure. story. Yeah. And, you know, he's experiencing these very like in the editing, these very sensual passions of, you know, her, their bodies entwined in the bed and these live sex performances. And, you know, whereas you know, uh, for, for Fox, he's more thrilled at the, just the plan, the yes. operation, like how yeah. it is that mm-hmm, we job. are. Yeah. Like yeah. actually doing this job that we are doing. And he actually thinks that it's counterintuitive. He's like, you know, you, you know, you're supposed to be teaching her how to make a guy fall in love with her, not falling in love with her yourself. Like you yeah. fucking dumbass. Like, I don't think you understand <laughs> what it is that, and, 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 and where Walken gets thrilled is in the hustle. Like when he goes yep. into that scene, yeah. when he renegotiates the price up and he goes, well, this guy's worth a lot more than 50 million. How about a hundred million? Which by the way, they're only paying Sandy 1 million. Yeah. So like yeah, even off the beginning, she was already being screwed on the deal and now she's being like doubly screwed on the deal. And, and like, this is what excites uh, Fox more than anything else. There's yeah, even this it, great bit where he, he celebrates that, uh, uh, renegotiation that he makes, especially too, where he's just like, did you see the part where I like broke protocol and dropped the name of the competition and made them like <laughs> shit themselves? I'm like, I'm the best at this job. And he's like, and to celebrate, I wrote a haiku, which is just walking at his finest. I, he, I don't even, he might've just improvised this, but he straight up goes, a dog walks into a bar and he's wearing a suit shirt and a tie. And he says to the bartender, I'd like a scotch and toilet water. And then he doesn't even know, like, like Defoe, like, kind of chuckles at it. And he's like, it's a haiku. You know, it's a haiku. It's a good haiku. I also and, think it's... And, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, I was, I, I was going to say, um, it's also very funny to me that, like, a lot of the time you see X and, and he, he seems to have a more a grasp on at least trying to make human connections, even though it's still very transactional a lot of the time. And every single time um, you see Fox kind of live up and especially, you know, do motions of like uh, sex or sexual into windows. Like for instance, when he's, when he's getting the hundred million dollar deal uh, with the corporation, that's one moment where he, he puts his cane between his legs and starts like fucking the air <laughs> and stuff. And it's just like, you can tell that that's just where his excitement lies and where, and where his, yeah. um, his passion, I guess, lies. 
He's a salesman fundamentally. Like yes. that's yes. that's what he ultimately is. If if, if any of you guys have ever worked in yeah. sales, there's guys that you will encounter like and they're just they're just salesmen. They don't they don't care what they're selling. Yeah. They don't care the circumstances. They just want to sell. They want to close the deal. Um and that it comes through so strongly in like in that character. He's just a salesman. Even he could be friendship. selling anything. Yeah, yeah. And and it's 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 that quality of like of like fakeness that seems like it's it's so stupid that it seems genuine. Yeah. Where it's like he he seems so fake, but he's so fake for so long that you're like, I guess he's just like this. He's just like so I guess good he's at just it. kind of this guy. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and and even even X like in that conversation where they're having, which by the way, I love the composition on it, like the fragmented shot, reverse shot, where like they're never in the shot together and the camera is act the negative space is behind their heads like away from each other and you can see them out of focus in the mirrors like beside Mm -hmm. and across from each other like being almost like sliced up by the mirrors and like completely disconnected because x is trying to look at this guy and he's just like is this it is this you're just happy with this like is a hundred million dollars going to fill this pie shaped wedge in your psyche is how he describes Mm -hmm. it and what and fox just straight up goes what is the psyches this introspection this talk does not be does not uh, be fit does not behoove a gentleman you know like this, <laughs> he's, he's not thinking about the existential qualities of am i going to fall in love am i going to get married which you know really troubles x when he gets jealous of the fact that he has pushed sandy into this position where she might be falling in love with this with the scientist he has no idea and he actually gets incredibly jealous and it starts a fight and you know between them and t- to which sandy goes like look you did this <laughs> yeah you not one you taught me to do this and i'm doing a good job and he's like wow you're doing a good job at getting a guy to leave his family and his career like good for you and he's just like hey hey you know like you're we're all in the same deal together like we're all doing this and mm-hmm. then X, I think, clarifies where he says, look, I'm not angry. I'm confused. And I think that's the feeling the film really gets at is Mm, that confusion is that, you know, he's at one moment. He's having these intense, real, quote unquote, real passions with Sandy. And then immediately he has to relegate and, you know, tamper them down to go back into the real world. Like he's not even at first interested in the prostitutes that Fox brings to him when they order four of them after to make a giggy giggy after their deal goes right. And they get the hundred million. (laughs) He's yep. first not interested, but then you can watch him just do it. He goes through the physical motions of it, and then he there's this he great wide shot of him. Yeah, and then there's this great wide shot of him after the fact, kind of regretting it and just thinking of Sandy and you know saying mm-hmm. her name out loud and all of this. He's incredibly down bad, just in general. But <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> there's there's also this quality of again, yeah, he's he's very confused. He's like, if this is how the world operates, how is someone supposed to just yeah get married and have a house and like what are these old where are these you know old school values of you know uh, these romantic gestures that used to exist? And she says to him straight up i will run away with you which is like the most romantic thing and you in that moment it's again it's left ambiguous but i think argento performs it well and he does think about it after the fact and he goes what if she was like telling the truth what if she was willing to just run away with him in that moment and they could have just abandoned the deal and run away together but he goes no we are too we're too tied into this world we're too tied into the job that we're doing we have to see it through and who knows, that might be the moment where she she said, OK, he's not real. Now I'm going right. to betray them. You know, we don't. That, that's just it. I like that the movie leaves yeah. it ambiguous enough that that could have been the moment where she decides to do that. Because like even maybe I'm a sucker, but I, I believe her in that in that moment. It, it feels very genuine between the two. Just I think it's because of how she reacts to his jealousy. Um, it, mm. it feels like a genuine moment but that that is the thing about the film is that by the end it leaves you just as confused as as x is uh when it comes to that recontextualization recontextualization so um yeah yeah i I feel you for sure Mm -hmm. by the way something that i want to mention um and i i don't know where else it would come up so i'm just going to bring it up uh hiroshi is played by uh yoshitaka amano 
who um, is not really an, an actor. He's mostly known as an illustrator. Um, and if mm, anyone is a fan of, of uh, Vampire Hunter D, the uh, the manga for that, he, he illustrated the manga for that. Oh, cool. He did a lot of the early art that was like really iconic character uh, portraits for the early Final Fantasy games. That's him. Like he's hmm. primarily oh, wow. a manga artist and illustrator. Um, and that's who's playing Hiroshi. He's like a he's he's, he's like a huge deal in uh, manga and like eighties and nineties uh, video games. Um, oh, that's cool. very very good illustrator, and it's interesting that's, that he pops up here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, similarly, uh, one of the Hosaka executives is Ryuichi Sakamoto, which like one of the like preeminent Japanese electronic musicians. Like mm. he was in um, oh shit <laughs> yeah like Ye- Yellow Magic Orchestra and um, you know all his solo things as well. Uh, so it, it's it's very interesting that um, you know that his all his music is very you know forward thinking. So I, I, I it's 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 very fitting that he's in like a you know an Abel Ferrara cyberpunk movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I love the images. Speaking of Hiroshi, I love when we're introduced to Hiroshi and it is just all straight up through like this, like security footage that they or like, oh, yeah. you know, sort of like voyeuristic footage they've taught. And they're like, yeah, here he is on tape. Like, look at him. And you know, it's just shots of him like doing his work and they're like, wow, he is a genius. And there's like these cross mm-hmm. fades of like these like psychedelic neon splotches over his face. And then there's that moment where they're showing him that he, you know, that he does order these prostitutes and they have video, like basically pornographic video of him. And there's walk in just looking at him and be like, look at that. He's got everything, but he doesn't have (laughs) passion. Look at his face. His face says it all. And it's funny because they might as well just be like describing themselves or, or describing X (laughs) at that point as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. And, and as Jamie mentioned, like that's all we see of him. We only ever see video footage of him. We never actually have a scene with him beyond, you know, he's not actually humanized. He's he, yeah, he's made an, an object and a tool inside a screen. He might as well not even be like an actual person. He might not even be real, uh, (laughs) as far as, as far as we're concerned. But then we find out obviously that he, alongside a bunch of the other scientists who it's very funny, (laughs) They, they, you know, X and Fox have completed the job. They've delivered him to Hosaka. And then he sees that there might be some sort of power struggle happening inside Hosaka because they they haven't isolated him like they should. It's like a prized possession. They put him in the playpen with the other high value bodies, like a bunch of, again, like traded show dogs all hanging out together. And he goes, well, something's going on here. I smell like more money here. He wants to like re up. He's like a gambling addict. He wants to go right back into the job. He wants more. And X is like, look, I said that I would meet Sandy afterwards. Like, I'm just out. We're going to take our money and we're going to cut and run, which he also doesn't realize that uh, she has helped as far as we know. Uh, orchestrate the death of all of these scientists using what they describe as a poisonous DNA synthesizer. (laughs) And then all of their money is gone. All of these guys are dead. They're surrounded. They're under assault. Walken fucking leaps to his death in this like really bloody like security footage of him like bleeding out on the ground as like people are looking around done for him. It's everything that he did care about because that's like what I was saying earlier. It's just his passion lies in the job. So as soon as that hundred million dollars is ripped away from him and he has nothing left and it's like, well, I guess it's over. This this was my only reason to live. Um, he, He almost happily goes over the balcony. So. Yeah, well, and 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 I find that ta- just that moment of like security tape footage of his death really impactful because like the whole mm. film up to this point has like it's blended the tape footage stuff as like the job, but also kind of like the fantasy as they're watching the pornographic stuff, but then also like their memory because like the opening scene is like Defoe almost recalling what he's seen as if he saw it on like a videotape. And so like basically all of them are blurring into this single object into the way that the Frera has filmed Mm it. Mm -hmm. And then that results in Defoe having to disappear into the hazy underworld and retreating into the capsule hotel called the New Rose Hotel, where again, we've mentioned the final 20 minutes of this film become a remix of the film you've already seen. But the scenes are played actually slightly differently. Um, There is actually changes of words and even, you know, going on there to just make Mm -hmm. you doubt yourself even more. 
and we watch all of the stuff that happened with Argento, including you know the mission to get her involved and get her to seduce Hiroshi, their meeting, the hotel sex, the you know the sensual musical performance where Argento and Defoe just full tongues out, uh, <laughs> t- just t- touching each other. Um, the <laughs> And then the horrible final results, obviously, of the mission where everyone died and the money is gone and how these two, how these things have to be connected in some way. But he can't figure out how they were. And I've just never seen in filmmaking such an amazing depiction of isolation and fragmentation in essentially like stream of consciousness. Like that's what we're experiencing with the Defoe character. Like pretty much going through his memories and they're just, he's questioning them himself. So it's not like we as an audience are going to get any answers. He can't find them himself. So it just leaves. Yeah. And there's almost this, there's this uh, elliptical, like incomplete frustration to the entire mm-hmm. film in general. Yeah. That then, when you apply it, that you, know, you realize that this is the you know the actual sense and experience that this character is getting. And ostensibly, we have just watched a, and in terms of frustration, I mean it in in the in the sense that we have watched a thriller where all of the plot and all of the things you would normally put in a thriller, like a chase scene or a heist scene, or mm-hmm. you know, like with the, yeah. you know, they're skipped over or they're irrelevant, and they take backdrop to the voyeurism and the performance yeah. it, and these feelings of what's tangibly real or human in this corporate hellscape of steel and mirrors and screens and bars and hotels and everything. And that way I'm actually reminded of the, uh, what we just talked about a couple weeks ago with man's Miami vice, just then, mm-hmm. you know, instead of having mm-hmm. that, uh, lushness, uh, and like pure romanticism, this has something a little bit more mundane and kind of empty by the end. But it, it's interesting that you can tell that Frera he he almost he wants to get to that place he wants to believe in the entrancing beautiful woman singing her song and then he just throws in the actual horrifying realities of the world around him which again is witnessing horrible deaths due to false flag kidnappings and <laughs> corporate trading of human bodies and uh, you know but it's just it's interesting it's like it's a complete blend of that mundane reality and like a genuinely like hypnotizing you could say masturbatory and dreamy (laughs) like stream of consciousness dystopia that he's actually depicted and i think that the final moments are what really send this one over the top for me because the movie just becomes pure pure expression of of everything that we've seen like all he's like how does all of this add up how do my feelings fit in how does the video footage fit in how do my memories fit in are my memories right were my feelings right were they made up which you know like it's just and all, all of it collapses into each other and you're just like what the fuck <laughs> yeah and it still yeah, feels it, like him as a character is still latching on to that that romanticism and love because i think yeah one of the he wants to believe like, till the end baby you, yeah the, i think the la- one of the last lines if not the last line that he remembers her, her saying is like, if you really want to, we'll walk away. And even though he's confused and disoriented and doesn't really understand if it was real or not, um, that's what he's latching onto. Um, and I mm-hmm. think even the last image is like them in bed and kissing. And so it, it, it's just, yeah. it, it, it feels as if he, even though there's a lot of him that probably thinks that it wasn't real, he can't detach himself from it. And he's like, it was the it feels like it's the only real thing that he's felt in years or maybe ever. And he's like, yeah. well, fuck it. I'm just going to hold on to it as <laughs> best I can. And it's so sad. Yeah, honestly, it, it it feels like the film intentionally keeps the audience in that moment mm-hmm. of like fresh grief, like where you mm-hmm. can't like yeah. it has. It hasn't been processed and you keep mm-hmm. kind of I, I, I don't know. P- personally, when something really shitty happens to me, I almost like revisit it mentally. Yeah. Just kind of like poking at it like a painful tooth or yeah. something mm-hmm. like to yeah. see to see if it still hurts. And it feels like the film keeps you in that moment right up until the end. There's there's no closure. There's no. OK, I'm feeling better now. There's no getting over this. He's still like you said, he's still just keeps coming back around and around and around. And it's like maybe if I think about it again, it'll it'll maybe yeah. my memory will be different this time. Maybe it'll hurt yeah. a little bit less. It'll change this time. after the 10th time that I go over that <laughs> same scene, you know, uh, like yeah. it, it, it's. It, he almost he's, he's trying to almost cushion it for himself um but it just keeps making it more painful 
it's, it's I also wild. love the uh, the the transition point in the film for me is when you get that handheld footage in uh, Marrakesh, yeah. which is like one of mm. the few moments where you're not in like a boardroom, and you, yes. it's kind of this very like weirdly shot, like like very very handheld. Kind of gives the impression of like s- somebody walking around with a camera or like a camera in glass. Like it's it it feels it, it conveys this sense of like. Um, Fox and X not actually knowing what's going on and having to rely on other people and like sub 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 operators to be their eyes it's all very very distant nothing is very clear you get moments where they're like oh here's one person why is he there why is he there um, and you you kind of get to see a little tiny bit of action but again you you miss it you still miss it even though you you get to go there to the location where things are going down just like Fox and X are, aren't actually actually privy to to the moment and again they're just getting this like through a phone call yeah or or when they go to vienna and you know they're going to intercept him on the vacation and all of the imagery that defoe can remember of vienna is literally just like argento like walking around in her bra and like a robe (laughs) and like that like he's so distracted from the actual work at that point he's just like literally he can't get over her just walking around in her heels and having sex with her in the pool which is something he revisits too at at the end where Mm -hmm. you know she actually i think in that scene in particular he revisits it like a few different times and every time he revisits it he's telling she's telling like a different story yeah and he's at it and you're just sitting there going man like what actually happened (laughs) (laughs) are you okay man um yeah uh, th- so that the final 20 minutes i think is a really uh, amazing uh, if you compare it to the short story it's amazing comparison of like adaptation where it's taking something from a story which is where uh, as kurt mentioned before the story starts with him in the hotel in new rose hotel thinking back about all of, you know everything that happened whereas in this it's uh it, the movie uh, you know, makes it into a scene that would not really be able to ex- be expressed with the written word, where it's like this, like, you know, a montage like, dreamlike state where, which is probably closer to how, y- you know, you would actually, your thoughts would actually be rather than just like a straight linear, well, exactly. I did this and did this. Like, and like, so the, like the, the sequence would have no yeah. feeling if it didn't have the actual build up to it. Whereas, yes. so like, that, that's where you mm-hmm. can tell Ferreira was like, I need to infuse this with real human yearnings and, yeah. you know, some of the, the confusion of the world that they operate in. And then I can just do like this hazy, like nonstop montage that absolutely fucks with everything that I set up. But if you just did the hazy, you know, fuckery, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't have the level of feeling, I think, that this one actually does, where, again, all of his memories and his passions and the performance and the job in the world have all just completely blended together where you just have Defoe looking at like a lone TV screen in like this, like again, like this capsule hotel that's basically just like a fucking box mm-hmm. and he's just like sweating and like whimpering and like, you know, like, like lying down and once again, thinking back to, you know, the very believable performance of she'll run away with him and then interspliced with walk in, you know, if you believe he will, and he has to go, man, do I have to doubt? Do I have to rethink that moment? And he, and he does eventually end on that. If you really want to, you know, when you come back, like we'll, we'll walk away from all of this. And he ultimately chooses to kind of end there. But it's interesting how that interacts with the walk in line that I think about a lot, which is the, the, uh, this is your ticket out of the boneyard. You're dead in case you didn't know it. You just don't have the sense to lie down. <laughs> and I think about that because literally the ending of this film is him crawling into a hole and lying down and like being sad. And like yeah, that I think is, he has a you gun know, too that he feels like it, yes. it, it seems like he's, you know, contemplating something very dark. So, yeah. Yeah. It's it's like a, it it captures this just this, this lonely, completely empty existence that was briefly hypnotized away from like that reality by this beautiful woman and like this musicality and you know and I love even the re- repetition of her song and how mm-hmm. she sings it and but it but it is incredibly bold to yeah have us never mm-hmm. see her again and just yes. be left with that desire and those memories and whether they were real or not no fucking clue. And yeah, it feels like he's just had this, you know, he just has to live with that or who knows what he does after that too. Right. So it's just, yeah. 
but yeah, I think uh, I think we'll pivot towards the reductive rating round on New Rose Hotel, which uh, which for me, this is one of my favorite Ferrera films. So I, I and I think it is probably I mean, it's hard to say, like with absolute certainty, but I yeah. do think this is kind of like on the lower end of the spectrum for most people for Ferrera. So I would argue mm-hmm. this might be his most underrated. Yeah, this um, made like twenty one thousand dollars yeah. box office <laughs> or something. It's <laughs> Dude, it got, wild. It, 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 it got laughed much. out of the Venice Film Festival. Oh like it got God. the worst reviews of his career. <sighs> um Dumb. And yeah, like <laughs> it, it like absolutely brutal because this this film I think is genuinely like haunting and idiosyncratic and it, again it's this futuristic espionage thriller but you know where human beings are reduced to labor and screens and traded like cattle by corporations but you know it it, it has this you know built-in formal reality of <laughs> your memories and this video footage and fantasies all being kind of blurred together and you have argento who, uh, you know, maybe despite maybe not being the best person, <laughs> uh, she is a very, and you can tell that Ferreira, if if the reports are true, is completely in love with her filming this. She is a oh, completely yeah. destabilizing, erotic force, an incredible performance that she gives. And you can tell that Lund, it feels similar to me to uh, what she did in uh, Bad Lieutenant and Miss 45. Like, you can feel that it's it's a woman taking control of this world but it's happening off screen and happening from the perspective of a character who is just completely entranced by her and it's so the movie is so horny and so lonely <laughs> and so despairing um i i really like the way that a friend of the pod doc uh reviewed this film and he said better than any other movie this is at capturing the forces that govern the world in terms of how yeah. deadly and inscrutable they are with their corporate maneuvering versus how you actually experience that world like in yeah. the moment, which is yeah. mostly Definitely. being in a room sad about a girl. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're a little <laughs> bug between giant forces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I just think I think it's just one of the like rawest expressions of, again, that horniness and the alienation and the despair and uh, yeah, I, I think about the song that, that girl performs at the beginning all the time, the falling in love without falling in love, because it, it feels like characters who are navigating this horrible, mundane world of transactions and, you know, yearning for, you know, a genuine passion and human experience within that. And yeah, it reminds me, honestly, of more of his more recent output, things like 444 or Siberia. Anyone who's watched been watching Ferreira's like more recent films, just mm-hmm. apocalyptically lonely and filled <laughs> with regret. And it feels like this was, uh, you know, this this feels like the transition film to that era for him. So uh, five for me. Nice. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm at the four right now, I think uh, I'm going to be revisiting this. I, I think Rewatching it too, just given that that twenty minutes at the end that recontextualizes everything would be very interesting to see it all in its, you know, full uh, spectrum. So, um, I, I love the characters. I think uh, I think the performances are really really good, including Argento. I think her kind of like unnatural moments uh, work really well, especially when it comes to looking back at their moments together between her and X, um, and not really knowing if it was romantic or if it was transactional or if it was maybe a little bit of both. Um, But I think it's it's saying a lot that I still, at least part of me, believes that it could have been romantic. But I'm I feel just as confused and maybe sad as as X by the end of this film. Um, I just it's it's you were you were moved by our girl. uh Asia. Yes, I fell in love. I fell in love. <laughs> um, queen. Y- yes. Actually, I'm going to re- remove that. Strike that queen from the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just the, the loneliness, the, the the kind of disorienting feeling you you feel looking back on his memories and, and um, just him looking at the same scene in a different way over and over again, much like you would if you had something you know, kind of traumatic happen and you just can't help but look back on it and see if you could see the clues, see the answers, but they're never there. I just think it's incredibly moving and very dark and sad. Um, but yeah, this this was this was really amazing. And I also think it's pretty like um, I thought this was going to be a lot more 
inscrutable in the sense that I wasn't going to understand what was really going on from moment to moment. But it's it's quite a simple film up until you get to that last 20 minutes of the disorienting feeling you have. So I I I, um, I was surprised by that. It, it is it, it is more simple than I than I thought it would be. So. Yeah, yeah, I think I think this is great. I'm gonna yeah, give considering it, a it right went now. over so many people's heads. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, for sure. And, and the, the the sort of lo-fi cheapness of it, I think people thought was like a limitation and wasn't like a choice. Which, if you read any interview with Ferreira, you could see that that's not true. Yeah, and in fact, and it I, feels like it's you know an accurate adaptation of the material. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think every time he's looking through that kind of like the surveillance footage um, and almost trying to find answers, it, it feels very similar to when you know you're like sifting through memory that are kind of hazy and um, distorted a little bit. So I, I just think a lot of this connects really well. So yeah, I'm going to give it a, a four out of five for now. Uh, whoever wants to go next between Kurt and Chris, fight over it. All right, well, I'll go. Uh, so I, I, I know it's probably anathema here, but I am half star gang. So I, I'm going oh, oh 4.5. Uh, oh get my God. Here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, Josh, you kind of said that uh, I, I appreciate this as like one of the best adaptations of a Gibson story that I, I think could, can be made. Like mm. there's so many of those ideas are conveyed in a, you know, a, without being, um, you know, like Johnny Mnemonic is cyberpunk and it's in your face cyberpunk. This is more leaning into his like corporate uh, you know, his corporate, uh, uh, you know, that kind of like, uh, uh, you know, corporations that this Zybats, I forget how he's what the term that he uses for those, uh, where these like giant corporates, uh, corporations just control everything. Um, but it also c- goes down to like the details. Like there's the scene, early scene when they first meet Sandy and Fox is kind of like dressing her down, trying to uh, you know warm her up for getting onto this plan. And he's like going down her outfit like that's a Chinese knockoff and like blah blah blah. And that's a very Gibson thing of like uh, you know being very focused on the clothes that are like. Um, brand names, but like brand names with like the the names sawed off. Like that's mm-hmm. that's a very Gibson mm-hmm. touch, um, and I think it's it's something that a, a lot of the uh, cyberpunk uh, things kind of like miss. I think, or at least Gibson uh, related type stuff misses. And I think this movie does an excellent job of that. Um, and you know, as we were all talking, like ev- everybody is fantastic. Christopher Walken is just having an absolute blast, and <laughs> Defoe is perfect as this kind of like he, he's very um, he's almost vacant for like the first couple until he starts like getting really closer to Sandy. But like yeah. he, he he seems yeah he he and and the, it's kind of makes sense because in the story he's he's like the narrator and he doesn't even ha- he doesn't really have a name. Um, so mm-hmm. it's it's an interest yeah it's it's interesting that um, he kind of fulfills that or fills that role at, at first. Um, and then of course that last 20 minutes is just, you know, brever- like you very, just a Brevera, uh, you know, filmmaking from, from Ferrer, like just uh, phenomenal, like recontextualizing everything you've seen and like getting you into this hypnotic state with like the repetitive images, the repetitive uh, voiceover of uh, Asia Argento saying, you know, we'll, we'll run off and get married and uh, all that stuff. It, it's just, it, it really hits. And, um, you know, it, it's just um, it, everything about it, I think, works. And, um, yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, it, it yeah. is interesting how much, like, emotion you end up pulling without much actual character detail from the Defoe character. Yes. Like, like, you, like you do leave mm. feeling a similar way that you do about, like, Light Sleeper. Uh, yes, the Paul Schrader exactly. film with, with Defoe where it's like this bleak vision of you know hit this clearly romantic a guy uh, mm-hmm. whose just feelings are constantly snuffed out by the criminal underworld like I'd say it's a very similar experience but you get yeah. a lot more like human detail out of yeah. the character in Light Sleeper and like his personality than you do um, in in this so I think it's a credit yeah, to Ferreira this almost feels that, like his personality is trying to to come out this entire movie and, it, and yeah. the moment that maybe Sandy could could do that it just gets wiped away from him so you you mm-hmm. never really figure out who well, he it, is because it person. contradicts the job it contradicts yeah. the plan it contradicts the way that the world actually operates and how money flows and everything right so it's yeah it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of it's trying to resist that um which is which is why it's detailed that way but uh for you kurt uh for for me this is a five um nice. and it, it might not be 
the most pleasing movie watching experience. I'll like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, in, in that, in that, I think the film intentionally denies you everything that you want from it. Right? I agree, hundred like, yeah. percent. It won't let you have it, and it I think that's what people were frustrated it. by. Yep. But yes. but you're right. It's it's intent. It's clearly deliberate. Yeah, and I, I think that that's so essential because for the reason that, that it's a five for me is because of its literary quality and the fact that it really honestly gets and goes to places within uh, within the genre of science fiction and cyberpunk that usually get papered over by cliche and like aesthetic flourishes. Because like yeah. I, I I love Blade Runner, I love Blade Runner, but. It is primarily an aesthetically cyberpunk film. It's mm-hmm. on a on a plot and characterization level. It really doesn't have that much to do, I would argue, with cyberpunk. It has much more. It, it's much closer to, much more straightforward science fiction, I would argue, than it is to cyberpunk. Um, it doesn't mm-hmm. really have quite so much of the that alienation, that sense of smallness among like data structures. It's it's you know it's a sci-fi film, whereas this I think really gets to that haunting late capitalist alienation that that sense of people being these tiny little bugs scurrying between massive corporations and these massive faceless forces that you'll never see you'll only ever get a tiny little peek at um and i i think just the way that it translates that and ferrara's intentionality in capturing that and the depth to which he understands it again although i get why audiences are are frustrated i think if you don't or if you can't understand this movie as cyberpunk, you don't really understand cyberpunk. You understand the visual qualities of it, but mm-hmm. you don't get it as as literature. And so I think this film as literature is what makes it a five for me. Plus everything else that we've said about the fact that the, the performances are terrific, the way it's shot, it's, oh man, the way that it captures in 1998 it captures the way that we look at 1998 now mm. right yeah like, yeah. like it's it, true it, yeah. it like retro futurist uh, yeah. but exactly. but like it was shot in the present day <laughs> yeah exactly it captures the shoddiness the kind of slightly cringiness of it the fact that nothing is uh, ultimately looks as cool as it as it actually turns out to be yeah that it looks uh, pristine but like tacky yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah yeah, and it's just it's it's such a it's such a forward thinking film aesthetically and stylistically that again I get why people are frustrated with it, but man, it's it does it for me. It rocks. Yeah, way way ahead of its time, um, as as uh, a lot of Ferrera tended to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up here for New Rose Hotel. We are going to be right back and we are going to be talking about a little film called Decoder. Stick around. All right, we are back and we are talking Decoder, the 1984 West German cyberpunk film directed by, ooh, I did, Kurt already said at the top of the show, Musha? Mo, um, I think so. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> one, one, one time director, I think, unfortunately. Um, so this is our first, going to be our first time talking about him. And this is based, obviously, on the, uh, the postmodern writing of Naked Lunch author William S. Burroughs, from what I understand as well, who makes a big old cameo in the film. I was excited to see him. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, like, this will be kind of our entry, entry point here. Because I don't Do you guys know much about the production of this? This I do much because it, I researched it. It's hard to find. You have to go. Uh, yeah. You have to look. I, I was going to say, can you, can you enlighten <laughs> us a little bit? Because I was not familiar with, because I know that this is like a bunch of musicians and countercultural figures yeah. who kind of got together and made a really low budget film, but I could not figure out the circumstances that like <laughs> industrial noise musicians and William S. Burroughs got together in Berlin and were like, Let's just make a crazy movie. Like what? So what happened there? Please, please explain if you know. I got some frogs. Know. I got some cameras. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, what what you said is is basically the genesis of it. Uh, there's a band called. Uh, so there's there's two bands. Uh, one is called Throbbing Gristle, uh, and they may be <laughs> Great the name. first electronic 
uh, band ever. Um, and there's another band called Einstrasende Neubauten, which is, um, if not the first industrial uh, band, then then they are one of the first and are foundational kind of to industrial music. Uh, Ooh, so in like 1981 or 1982, members of these two bands were living together in basically like a like a punk rock like squat, like an illegal squat in a uh, a a kind of seized warehouse that was in you know not in use and so they moved in and made this did it kind of look like the space. one in here where they're hanging out and they got things <laughs> that, on fire that, and they're putting on light is, shows and that I, is the I squad that is the squad <laughs> nice. awesome. um, so they got a hold of some cameras uh and there were a couple people who had some script uh scripting um experience uh class make I, I think is one of them and trini trim pop who is also a musician <laughs> Um, and they basically grabbed the members of these these two bands uh, <laughs> and just started kind of making like a weird guerrilla film. Um, and Incredible. They, they gradually pieced together uh, some funding and they were able to bring in like weird counterculture figures like William Burroughs. Uh, Genesis Porridge was uh, the, the the founder of uh, Throbbing Gristle, but was also kind of like a major counterculture figure at the time. Uh, Bill Rice, who was, I believe, New York-based most of the time and plays Jaeger, that kind of like weird detective guy in the film. Um, and they just kind of like m- made up and changed the script as they were filming it. And a, a, big, uh, a big event that happened during the filming was Ronald Reagan visited... Uh, Hamburg, where they were filming, um, and they got a bunch of Super 8 cameras uh, and gave them out to their weird punk rock friends because it became clear that there were going to be riots and widespread protests. And they said, go to the riots like you were planning and just get some footage for us. So um, oh, there's okay. a huge set piece with all this footage of these like riots. That that's all real. Just, it, like, looked, uh, yeah. like, it looked so authentic. I was like, is, did they really, were they able to set this up in this kind of low budget <laughs> film? And yeah. I was like, oh my God. Anyway. I assumed it was stock footage and it, yeah. it it kind of is in the sense that, you know, it's an actual event, but it's all their weird punk rock friends that were just like running around rioting and filming the riot that they were participating in. <laughs> Amazing. That's oh the coolest part though. Cause like you watch that footage and it feels like dangerous. It feels like you're in it. Like, well, like that that's, that's the- what makes a difference than just stock footage. Like you do feel like it, there's a participation quality to that footage that I have, find very, very evocative. I think they even have like characters in the film, a part mm-hmm. of those riots so that's where i was kind of yeah. having like yeah. this this cross <laughs> wired where i'm like it looks so authentic but we have the characters that i've seen for the last hour and 20 minutes so it was just like <laughs> yeah it was yeah. really cool yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I guess the last person worth mentioning is uh christian f um who also plays the character named christian uh in the film and she was probably the she she was somewhat famous at the time um, but was basically hiding out in Hamburg because she had written this memoir about basically being like a a like a heroin addict teen, like like fourteen year old on the streets of Berlin, uh, that came out and was made into a a very popular film called uh, called called Christian F. Uh, that was basically like a it's almost like a Harmony Corinne type film, but it's like it's like a documentary basically about about her life growing up um on the streets of berlin and she basically got she 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 decided basically that like fame was not allowing her to get and stay clean and so she moved to hamburg where she wasn't as famous uh and so here she is in the film um playing like you know a drug addicted sex worker uh but she was kind of so interesting because you know i had i i've had christian f on my watch list forever and i did not connect that this woman was named christian f that is her (laughs) yes that that, that's just that is her acting yep that's crazy well i mean based on all of the people that we have just described who got together got some cameras and went out and did some filming in berlin i think that those personalities kind of paint a picture of what this is yeah. like it, it, <laughs> yeah. like like if you Even if you the, say the, look you've the got you've got guy, the f- um that plays oh, fm yeah. has made the music for the film too so it's like yeah you know, whose least- name is also fm he is fm right. fm einheit from from einster's and new yeah. yeah yeah so you have like people on the forefront of electronic and industrial music you have you know sort of countercultural authors you have you know people who have written their own drug addicted memoirs you have people who you know, are the punk, literal uh, punk, 
punks <laughs> living in a squad who are filming actual riots taking place. Like this is a very like despite the fact that this is obviously a very strange and surreal film at times, I think this is an incredibly authentic depiction of a, you know, of the time and place that it came from while also trying to, you know, it's trying to be sci-fi. It's trying to be futuristic. And obviously part of the experience is the William S. Burroughs quality, who is known for, in terms of his writing, for the countercultural obscenity, the conspiratorial paranoia, and the drug addicted surrealism. Like anyone who's seen uh, Cronenberg's version of Naked Lunch or Red Naked Lunch, like I, I love the Both way that great. that film Both blends great. his, you know, it blends like his actual material with his real life, like his real political fears and his actual, you know, real life sexual repression and social isolation and everything like that. Like it, it's very uh, Paul Schrader's Mishima in that yeah. way, mm, which yeah. might be a fun pairing if we ever decide to do Naked Lunch on the show. Um, but it has that quality to it. And I was so glad that we did Liquid Sky because I think Liquid Sky yeah, prepared me for this. Definitely. Just like that movie and how much it is just like an 80s punk expressionist, like like lo-fi sci-fi kitsch type thing. Like it has like an avant-garde experimental quality. It has a campy mm -hmm. quality. It do, It's doing like a little bit of like a Warholian satirical sort of comic thing but it also has like that gorilla street grime exploitation quality and it's all about just depicting you know in the john waters sense like depicting you know your group of friends the mm -hmm. you know your freaks the dangerous world and alienated world that you live in and the you know the arts industry that you want to be a part of and that you seek ownership and control of and sort of like this liberating feeling of being able to finally just, you know, go out and film that and literally just grab cameras, grab your friends, go make something, make something crazy. And the fact that something, I guess, coherent kind of came of out of this. <laughs> coherent ish. <laughs> yeah, is is actually genuinely pretty surprising to me because I was able to trace this because I was like, look, there's this guy, there's this guy named Jaeger and he is a hunter and he is this, you know, this agent of a, of a government who's in charge of suppressing dissidents and he rubs up against what is now stay with me, a fast food <laughs> burger joint employee slash electronic musician named FM who's playing himself or at least a character named after himself and is also a musician in real life who discovers that by changing the background music from pleasantly calming sounds designed to, I guess, subliminally make the populace complacent Muzak, uh, Muzak <laughs> and instead plays real music <laughs> with these abrasive, disruptive industrial noise sounds. He realizes that he can wake people up. He can incite riots and revolution against the sort of looming consumerist subservience that they are all experiencing. And he can stir up real social and political unrest uh, in their sort of monotonous, decaying society using sonic frequency. And when you think about it, that is kind of the what the film is trying to be as an object like it's trying to be like just throw this kind of like giant weird fuck you into the ether and see if it disrupts something and it disrupts you know like the the, the general normalcy and that was where i thought a little bit about liquid sky as well because it absolutely yeah. has like that you know that punk expressionist yeah. yeah the transgressive quality exactly it, um it, one of the things it reminded me of especially early on is the the original short film version of THX 1138 Electronic Labyrinth THX 1138 which has okay. which which I think I think he made I think Lucas made in like 67 or 68 where he was still in college and he did the same kind of like guerrilla filmmaking process it's much it's much more stripped down that's very just like you know pointing a camera at like weird computers and like reel to reel tape machines and overlaying weird audio over top of it and there's a lot of stuff that feels very similar but yeah like if you take that you add in a bit of Repo Man and maybe a bit of John Waters, I, I feel like is you're kind of getting close to the experience of the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, so throughout the film, it, it, you're you're uh, you know bombarded with industrial and electronic. Most of it is excellent and and great, but some of it is rather you know discordant and you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, gets you makes you feel uneasy and things like that and then i love the one that just uh, is just sleazy city yes. over and over again <laughs> that's my favorite one that, that should be that could, could be our new theme song but, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. but well and, and it's not just um music though like they they uh throw like transgressive like video clips at you too like there's random yeah. video clips of like uh you know <laughs> 
surgical mutilation, like castrations, it seems yes. like. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, like, which appeared to be, like, real footage that... Yeah, uh, yes. It appeared real. to be real footage, yes. <laughs> yeah. Some, some sort of, like, death's head, like... <laughs> Somebody fucking a mummy head? Yeah. Uh, it seems yeah, to be? Th that's what it seems to be, yeah. And it definitely <laughs> looked like a penis. Like, that yeah. definitely did not look like a stunt penis that appeared to be an actual penis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, yeah, yes. it, it's, it's, all, it's all that kind of stuff, like, trying to get, you know, some sort of reaction out of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, like we, we have this quality of there is like when we open this film, for example, it's like these very textured, lo-fi Academy ratio, wide angle lens for like tracking shots of Bill Rice's Jaeger, who is this, you know, sort of like shadowy fascist government agent. And he's just powering power, walking through like corporate office and like walking down f fluorescent halls. And the camera is doing these like, sudden jerks and twists to keep up with him and sometimes even getting distracted and just like peering into a room where like people are doing all this typing and we see walls of tapes and code printers and lie detector tests and phones and computers yeah you get information and surveillance where they're all watching these monitors although i love too that you know he he's he's living that modern life he's got like six monitors he's a gamer yeah. and he's he's watching movies also while he's doing his work which i was like i relate to man i get it i get it <laughs> he's watching um, metropolis in particular yes yeah, yes yeah. which is yeah very uh, which is funny too because it, i actually thought more of fritz lang's uh, m speaking of fritz lang just like that part where oh yeah the, yeah there's a part where they have all the all the forensic evidence up on the screen and it it is like this it's like very very early um you know like uh forensic science depiction in m and i thought about him sitting there and like he even pulls apart where like it, it literally pulls up like their fingerprints and their names like side by side and everything yeah. like that it, yeah so like it, 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 there is like a fritz lang sci-fi kind of reality here but again i was reminded more of like you know the uh like just how disgustingly textured it is like this is why yeah. it pairs well with abel ferreira this yeah. is abel ferreira in this era in the 80s like when <laughs> yeah. that when, when his co-worker comes up yeah. to him and is just like munching on paste uh, next to him, oh yeah i, I thought he about the scene in driller killer where ferreira and just, just squirts the sauce in his mouth <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah he, he's eating like the, the the pizza in the most like you know mutant yes. way possible Exactly. That scene like still horrible. haunts me from Driller Killer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember it more than the than the drilling deaths in uh, yeah, Driller that's Killer. That's the most horrifying part in that whole film. <laughs> A point about the the depiction of like the database of human information. Um, yes, this is probably lost on a lot of people who are maybe younger than than you know their mid to late thirties, but. That at the time that this film was made, the idea of an infoscape, an information about you that lived off in computers in this big system somewhere that was instantly accessible, was still like fairly new and was mm -hmm. almost like as late as the mid '90s was seen as like kind of like if not a pipe dream, it was still had a quality of science fiction to it. Like yeah. like it mm -hmm. was only in like the mid to late nineties that even like police departments really started assembling these huge databases that could be cross referenced. So when when they're pulling up like people's fingerprints, their their gender, their names, their address, all this stuff on on like instant access along with video footage of them that's all cross referenced yep. and, and surveillance footage, that at the time it was made was a very science fictional concept. And I think the film is very intentional this is also this is a very industrial music type conceit like industrial music almost has as as a core concept this then sci-fi idea of like the real world bleeding into the infoscape into the machine world um and the film is like is depicting that in a way that probably seems trite and obvious now um you know when, right. when i mean i mean god what when did Minority Report come uh, report come out? Like 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 two thousand two, um, yeah. Like it's it's so far, or so much earlier than that, and we take so yeah. much of that, even that, for granted now. That like that aspect of it was science fiction at the time, and probably doesn't come across that way uh, now. But that's like really inherent to the. Yeah, I watch Minority Report now, and I'm like, this is just an episode of Law and Order. Yeah, yeah. Like, why is he doing it. all What's that shit? Yeah, I mean, he's got jetpacks, but you know, whatever. There's the another scene too where FM is like he he's dressed in the uh, the military uniform and he, and he goes to the arcade and all they're playing is war games. Um, yes, and they're yeah. just you know it's just That's simple such a 80s scene. pixelated stuff. But then they they splice in all of these the, this real footage of war and tanks and all of that. And 
and you know they didn't have it yet but it reminded me kind of of that, like the separation that would happen when it comes to in modern day like drones and and, mm-hmm. and things like that oh, yeah. it was like people just on a computer going okay press the button and now a hundred people die yeah. um and yeah there's 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 a lot of that that felt like in this movie that felt like it was kind of before it's time in in a little in a way um yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. And I, I also think that um, it's an important thing to remember is that this is 1984 in West Germany. Uh, they're right next door yeah. to the GDR, <laughs> who, and, who like imp- you know famously has the Stasi, who e- effectively has that giant store of information on every single citizen. Uh, it's mm-hmm. just not, you know, it's not. It's, uh, it's on like note cards. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's it, yeah, you know, it, it's it's like almost uh, you know the the. It's just like a, a you know a more lo-fi version of of the thing that they have in in this movie, um, I, but I think that kind of informs a lot of a lot of this too. Like with totally. like you know obviously the you know the final riot is a very um, you know seems very West German as well, like a, you know, very German uh, or definitely European thing because you, you don't see that kind of stuff in. I, mean, I guess the last one would have been what the the WTO riots in in Seattle yeah. in the nineties. But um, there's yeah. a book uh, from 2003 called Stasi Land by mm. Anna Funder that I read uh, a while ago that really goes deep into that like culture of fear and paranoia and like mass surveillance in East Germany, um, you know, do, like in the late 70s through the 80s um, that I think if anyone is interested in that kind of like weird, almost sci fi quality of of the time in which they were living, uh, I, I strongly recommend it. It's a it's a very it's a fascinating book. And it's 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 bizarre. Like it's it it's to the point of like there were there there were so many informants that like they would have multiple informants living in the same house that didn't know that each other were informants. It, it's just this bizarre, <laughs> like almost incomprehensible concept. That yeah, I think you're right. Deep, ha, deeply informs uh, the way that this film is uh, is uh, framed. Is even like there's, there, there's there's an element of like paranoia between the characters that are ostensibly friends. Yes, where like exactly. everyone feels mm-hmm. like they have like like a secret life. Um, like at, at one point, um, some of FM's kind of like maybe slightly more normy or just kind of like regular punk friends are like, what do you go off and do every night? And he's like, uh, none of your fucking business. Yeah. <laughs> Mind your own business. I don't do anything. Um, and, and yeah, we, we see him like dressing up in a military uniform and going to the arcade. It's like, I don't, I don't really know how that fits into the, into the plot, but it, it does kind of make all these characters like they just all have a weird double life. Yeah, that they're doing. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, and I think it's important too that it opens with the government agents. Like, like you, you, you get that there is there is a a very uh, sort of powerful and dominant overseer before we actually get because because we cross cut to him accessing his data machine next to his coworker who is just munching disgustingly, <laughs> and then it, it that immediately cross cuts over to FM who is also eating, but he's eating just like cold hot dogs, like straight out of the bag. <laughs> and like, a, he's got like a pile note, of Mars yeah. bars. Yeah. Um, and, and he's sitting there like munching on cold hot dogs, oh, cold hot dogs and being like, if you don't know who the enemy is, you have to be careful. You know, mm-hmm. and then and then yeah, he 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 gears up like he's a soldier. There's like this propulsive cross cutting between him and all his friends going out, and also like this very sort of imposing concrete architecture of just like uh, d- d- where did they film this? Was this this is in the west the west block? I assume. Yeah, yeah. This was uh, this is all in uh, Hamburg. Yeah, because because okay. all of the like uh, like abandoned, rundown, like graffitied buildings, just like they like the location work is amazing. Of like these characters just walking <laughs> around, like it helps them. It helps them out a lot that it looks like they're walking through like a like a like an actual battlefield for most of this yeah. film. Or the uh, the the one scene that's in that that weird like landfill where there's just trash yes. as far as yeah I can see. But yeah, it by looks the like way, an apocalypse. that. It, so that 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 was an industrial landfill outside of Hamburg, and it like shortly after the film was made, uh, it turned out to be like intensely contaminated with like dioxin, Ooh, um, and, and was like one of the most contaminated sites in uh, Western Europe. Apparently, oh so. my god! Uh, but it, it looks it looks fucked. Um, by the way, the the scene with uh, Jaeger and his coworker, I don't even know if if he actually like has a name. He's just kind of like the nerd. Um, <laughs> Those guys are, are are the two, really the only two professional actors uh, in the film. Um, that's uh, Rolf Richter, who was in Das Boot, 
uh, as, oh, okay. as like one of the sailors. Um, and then uh, Bill Rice was uh, actually had like a decently long career as an actor. Um, people might recognize him from Coffee and Cigarettes, the Jim Jarmusch oh. uh, film. He's mm. he's in one of the later segments as as Bill. I, I was very shocked to find out that uh, Bill Rice or, or the guy who played Jaeger was an American because he is the most German like angular face that I was like, oh man, yeah. <laughs> he does. They have he looks like scary. really fucked up. They have fucked up makeup on him. I think. Yeah, he, the, lo- he looks like uh, the giant from Twin Peaks. That's what I was <laughs> yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah, he does. <laughs> he's an he's an interesting character too because he um, um he kind of reminded me of of X in New Rose Hotel mm. just because yeah, yeah. he's got that you know obviously he has the the. Uh, presence of just a, a corporate face and a suit um and you know but but then we see him go to the the uh the strip club or the peep show and he seems to be very intrigued by um i believe it's chris christiana um mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so there's this like it, it feels as if even though he's very you know grounded in his work and what he's been doing for so many years he still feels like he's trying to find this human connection or or at least he sees her and and goes like oh this this is a feeling i haven't felt in a in a long time and i'm going to pursue yeah. that even though it's still incredibly transactional just like x and sandy was so i thought that that was a a cool little thing similarity that i spotted there it, yeah his, 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 oh go ahead Oh, I was gonna say there, there's a scene later in the film where um, he's basically being dispatched to kill FM, um, and they, they don't mm-hmm. they don't say it outright, but they say like we don't like this guy, and I don't want to see <laughs> we him don't again. like his wink, face. Wink. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, as he's riding in the car with like one of the other bureaucrats, it's not really clear. What, it seems like his boss or his controller or something, and he just says, uh, "You used to be better." Is, is like yeah. his only comment to him and, and this this sense and and you don't really ever apart from that get any sense of like how he fits into the organization what the organization is like apart from you get this one snippet of like he is okay maybe he's a little bit over the hill like maybe he's like a little bit old-fashioned just like x yeah. like he's kind of struggling to stay in the game a little bit yeah yeah, that's actually what I was going to say, because he what, what he reminds me of the way he carries himself in terms of his performance. He reminds me a lot of like an old school noir character. Yeah, like yeah. he feels like he it would be more at home in like a Humphrey Bogart story. And here he is in like this. He's lived long enough and aged long enough to be in like this weird retro futurist world <laughs> where it's like. I don't actually, you know, like I used to do cool PI missions and have sex with the girl. And now I'm like, I'm not exactly sure what it is that I'm doing. And I (laughs) I got like weird punks playing music and all the girls are at like these disgusting peep shows and like, you know, and, and even that scene where he's driving, like everything about his experience is off kilter. Like even that, a simple scene like him driving around in a car with his boss the way that that shot is insane and it could just be a mistake i don't know but this part worked <laughs> for me there's this part where the lighting setup changes between each shot mm. uh whether oh, who the it's lighting in at. this film is so cool well because when it when it's on him the entire car is lit blue when it's on the boss the entire car is lit purple and it literally just cuts between these two as if they're in the same space but the color is not the same in the two shots while they're sitting there talking about like you know natural bloat versus like a lucrative bloat and (laughs) yeah so i i think that had to be intentional because one of the few really clear obvious artistic decisions i think is is in the heavy use of like colored gel oh, lighting yeah. like every yes. scene has these like these like split colors where one character um especially in scenes with uh, christiana and yeah. fm one character will be in yeah, like, all the green heavy green lighting one of them will be in heavy blue lighting and the um, green and it's almost always feels like, like a mix between it's sickly but there's also yeah. the kind of natural and nature aspect of it because of the frogs mm-hmm. and all of that so it, it feels yeah. like both of those worlds are kind of colliding with her a little bit or mm-hmm. in in the peep show um christiana is lit in like very very heavy red mm-hmm. and then they show um Jaeger's all the faces face, watching and it's very blue it's like heavy like it's very totally heavily cold. shadowed blue yeah yeah, d- d- Jamie, did that scene remind you at all of Crimes of Passion? That was where my head oh, immediately yeah. went when totally. uh, Anthony Anth- it's Anthony Perkins is going into one of those peep shows and just watching, or a little bit of even hardcore when you have George C. Yeah. Scott like ripping through those porno sets or something. Like it, it feels then, like a very <laughs> lo-fi cyberpunk like depiction of sleazy prostitution booths in like a, 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 a similar way, where like the girl is spinning around and various men's faces clearly masturbating 
to her. Yeah, but there's and, no and, like and emotion like, from them. That's the one thing that freaked no, me out. They start doing this pan <laughs> where it, it just shows all of the people watching her, all all men, and they don't have smiles, but they don't have like a grimace or anything. It's just kind of like completely unemotional and just like this is just what I have to do in this mechanical this, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah yeah exactly and even the well, dancers and, and, like as they're putting on a performance um, it, th- they don't have much going on either when it comes to their emotions it's just like everybody is just locked in this just kind of monotone sense of how they're feeling it's just, it, it feels completely cold and uh, it, like inhumane oddly enough yeah, well, and she's the old fashioned show, too, right? Like she's like like that's the she's the old school. Here's the girl, naked girl. Everyone peeps at her. But like the introduction to that thing was the the, the element that you guys were talking about where the um, there's, you know, like before we see that element, this is all one establishment. This is also where the video booths are where they're walking around and you can see videos of like a dude scalping a dude, or you can see yeah. genital mutilation, or you can see necrophilia, like take your pick, you know, Wh- whichever one of these things you want to see, you can either go into a video booth and watch one, or you can just go watch the old fashioned girl spinning around half naked. You know, it's kind of up to you, but, but even that stuff is also always disrupted one by the colors, one by the, you know, the focus on the faces and the eyes, but also just this general weird, like kind of ambiance that the film has where there's always like TVs in like every room and they're constantly playing like real, you know, historical war footage or something. And mm-hmm. the characters are constantly walking around this like palpable sort of grimy aimlessness, like even things that should be quote unquote, like, you know, cleaner, like even the fucking burger joints yeah. <laughs> are just they're, they're, like everything about them is bizarre. Like that sequence where they are training the new employees. Oh, that's so <laughs> good. I love that. That's, that feels like, and it's like, it, it's video. like a sweaty jazzercise yeah. like sequence <laughs> where they're teaching them how to say the corporate slogans. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah he, well, he's, he's drilling them like the military, which is in, like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that bit. I, I think like, I, I really like that. The focus was on a burger joint. Because it, it's so that I I think leans into some of the cyberpunk stuff too because it's like you know big giant corporation, um, but it also I going back. Oh to yeah, the, there's great images of McDonald's and Burger uh, Burger King. Yes, in this. yeah, yeah. Well, and, and <laughs> at one point FM says I, I think the M of the McDonald's looks like uh, mother's breasts or something like that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I wonder if they got a McDonald's and Burger King to sign off on that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate. I, I also think this is where like the West Berlin uh, or West, excuse me, West Germany connection comes in because this is like you know like I, like we said uh, with um, this is the '80s where like um, you know uh, post war uh, American style capitalism is really being yes. pu- pushed on, um, uh, p- particularly West Germany. And so, of course, like a, an American style burger joint would be like getting huge in there. Um, and it also like reminds me of things like um, you know Judge Dredd had a had a long uh, arc about uh, he's going into the cursed Earth, which is populated by ro- uh, roving gangs of like fast food joints, like like they yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's just all this like um, you know uh, American style con- consumerism and capitalism mixed in with you know militarism and uh, you know the fu- and and future, and I, I just think it, it's just perfect for this movie and and where it's set and where it was made i i think that just really works fun fact Chris. and where, where do death frogs fit in oh, is the real question right. yeah that I so have, that's I'm that's having, that's pure burrows uh, assassins that, pure, that castrate burrows. uh did did you know princess die gave birth to frogs is <laughs> what, what one character says to another at one point i which i didn't know it could be true so if if anyone has has read um, the uh, the the book Naked Lunch, um, Burroughs has a real fascination with like I don't know like harm to animals. There's a lot of just weird shit about about animals um, in in that in in that book, uh, and I feel like that is a very strong Burroughs influence of like the kind of natural world of animals versus like the mechanical info world of humans, um, and it definitely seems like a non sequitur. Uh, in, in the film, um, again, that that's one of the things that I, I can't quite explain why, but reminds me of Repo Man in, in a weird way. That kind of like just strange, like 
little bits of gross, fleshy, organic stuff in with very modern corporate, mm. you, you know, fast foody f- feeling stuff. Um, like honestly, if if this film had had a scene where they went to a store and bought beer that was called beer, that would have been perfectly that that would have fit perfectly in with the film. Um, but yeah, I I feel like the frogs are very strange and off putting, and I feel like that's all that they're there to do <laughs> to be changed and off putting. But yeah, it's that's that's a pure Burroughs thing. Oh, but Chris, what I was gonna say is um, the film was the original title for the film. Uh, I don't know why it's called Decoder, uh, but it is. It was originally called Burger Creek, which uh. both means Burger War, and it effectively means Civil War in German. So it was originally uh. like a double entendre. Um, but yeah, you you are spot well, on. Burger about, War like, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I get the impression later on that like the burger co- like the fast food companies are like part of the government maybe. Like, well, yeah, because w- there's that scene where they go to Jaeger's like organization is like, so we need you guys to kill these people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're disrupting the fast food restaurant. Yeah, he's getting like, well, yeah, and, and, and the fast food restaurants are the ones playing the tapes that have the Muzak that makes everyone passive and these horrifying images of just mm. people just biting into these ketchupy flat, oh. like paste looking burgers. <laughs> that looks that like just the squeeze worst McDouble out. you've ever had in your life. <laughs> yeah, like, like it, it looks like the one that you would only stomach because it's 3 a.m. and they're You're the only hammered. thing that's yeah. open. <laughs> yeah, and that, that kind of and... reminded me of some of the <laughs> scenes in uh, Messiah of Evil, where like it's it's this this great horror film uh, from the I think the mid to late seventies, kind of like a weird horror, almost zombie film in like a beachside town. There's this scene where the characters go to a supermarket and see the townspeople just like eating raw meat in the supermarket. <laughs> it has that that quality of just like yeah, it's just it's just disgusting. And it's like it's a it's a context where they should be eating food, and it seems disgusting. And it's also got this nice uh, quality to it, where um, FM like covers his ears up with his hands, and it cuts over to what seems like the the actual reality, where they just have these weird, hungry, monstrous expressions, and yes. the simulated reality of the Muzak. Everyone just looks like perfectly happy, and they're getting along and laughing and smiling. And then he again, yes, he covers we're his selling ears happiness. Yeah. They say right. Yeah. Yeah. No, like that, that, that stuff is, is, is great because like the actual like wide angle lensing of how horrifying it looks to him versus like what it is that they're experiencing, just drinking out of the styrofoam cups and, and the sound, like he starts to, he basically decides that if he's going to experience it this way, then everyone else has to. And he needs Mm -hmm. to essentially destabilize the vibe and destabilize the film at the same time. Like, so he starts going home and taking these bizarre sounds of the world that he's seeing. And I love those shots of him just like, actually working on his music like in his yeah in in, in his room where you can see all like the, the cranes in the background and with these yeah he's working with the equalizers and you can see him being kind of like inspired by what he's seeing outside so he starts to take the noises and these off-putting noises of the actual world that surrounds him mm-hmm. and starts blending them with these spacey pulsating kind of you know like actual sort of industrial noises and he intentionally wants to create this ear infection that is going hmm. to undo this conditioning that is everyone is experiencing, which then mm-hmm. involves him literally doing like tape recorder terrorism mm-hmm. at like McDonald's and Burger King and literally just like taking the tape out, putting his tape in and, you know, starting trying to freak everybody out. Yeah, what I like yeah, too is that it feels unclear if he's doing it to like free people of what he thinks is this complacent mindset or if he's just doing it because he's like, fuck this environment that yeah. I'm living in. I'm just going to rebel and have it turn into chaos. Yeah, he definitely doesn't have like a, po- a like a coherent political mission yeah. when he starts out. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and he only really, yeah, he, he does meet some people who have, who seem like committed revolutionaries. Um, there's like a, kind of like a weird, I don't know, it's like an info cult, almost like a religion or like a, like a, almost like, a, so it's like, I mean, it's, it's important context for the time in which this was made. Um, there was people like the Red Army faction um, that were active in West Berlin that were like communist terrorists, essentially, ba- that were trying to directly attack. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. The Bader Meinhof uh, complex. Um, and they were like trying to directly attack capitalism. So it feels very tied in with that, that imagery where he runs into these weird revolutionaries who live in like a burned out building. Not really clear how he winds up there. Um, the, the, the kind of 
leader who gives a speech about like information. Um, that's uh, Genesis Porridge. Um, a yes. super yeah. interesting. Well, you, because because he, he's he's like look I I see he's trying to get his tape back because they get his tape I think is the idea and he talks about oh, this idea of how he's okay. been because I think he goes out into the world trying to record more sounds and trying to find like these weird noises and like there is like this you know you're recording things and then re-recording over top of them and like cre- transforming and create like it's almost like this video drone idea of like you know transforming and demolishing harmonies I think is how he describes it and then that's when yeah the, the priest is straight up like you know know we need to create this inform short circuit of information mm. and they realize that this guy actually could kind of be a tool because at first they actually like kidnap him and they put him in front of their like what is that like that old school like uh you know sort of oh, like they, yeah it, it's, it's like a candle in the middle and it's like spinning around oh, and zoetrope. like projecting light yeah yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah it's like a zoetrope yeah <laughs> yes it's a, it's a west german zoetrope instead yeah, of american yeah. zoetrope <laughs> yeah by, by francis um, ford uh uh <laughs> yeah. Um, but, so Genesis Porridge, I just want to say something uh, about about um, she, she uses. So she is uh, super duper gender queer from a time when there were not established conventions. So I'm going to do my best job that I can with uh, uh, he her pronouns. Um, sh- she prefers like S slash he, which I'm not sure how to pronounce she, she he, I think. Um, mm. But uh, she, she, he was a a foundational figure in industrial and and electronic music. Part of the band Throbbing Crystal, like I mentioned. Um, if and and apparently improvised basically all of he her um, lines in this film of that that kind of like speech. Wow. Uh, and um, if anything is a more science fictional character than even the film. Um, a, a few years after the film came out. Uh, he her married um, a, a a partner named Lady J, and they decided to they embarked on this thing called the Pandragine Project, where they they wanted to become the same entity. So they both became <laughs> G- uh, G- Genesis Porridge, and embarked on basically a project of like surgical modification of their bodies to become essentially identical. Like both to both become this kind of non-binary, like third wow. third gender, uh, super interesting, like revolutionary genius person who's also a very good musician, and I think it does a pretty good job acting here too. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. it's just it's again it's one of those things about this film where it's like it's interesting to see like wow there's like really really countercultural figures that show up uh, in this film and and again like yeah from all kinds of well different scenes actors. yeah. Yeah, because yeah, all this stuff with the high priest and just like because it totally switches because we, we've had like the sort of like the, the 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 burger joint stuff. We've had like the fascist agency. We've had, you know, his sort of like rundown apartment. But the high priest area, it's like this fiery concrete, like techno dystopia <laughs> like, underworld. Yeah, like it's like just smashing there. shit. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like leather and like dilapidated buildings and graffiti. And they're like there's punk sermons and, you know, like and, and they, they finally do let him go and they, you know, they they let him get his tapes and they actually help him they actually they are the ones i think who start delivering some of his tapes eventually to the uh to the the burger king and the mcdonald's afterward when they're start, like they're like yeah let's let's hit let's hit everything and let's you know let's disrupt this because they uh they say that yeah everyone knows that they control everything with sounds like they've been doing that since the gestapo or something like that is yeah. is is what they say <laughs> christiana um, says that it's like since the gestapo figured out how to make music how, how to use music to make make people shit their pants or yeah, like shit yes. themselves <laughs> to death. The, the, the gestapo has found the brown note <laughs> <laughs> But 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 yeah, all of the like gen, like general chaos that sparks from these sequences are really interesting because at like obviously this is the part where we're saying they really took Super 8 cameras. They just hand put them in the hands of actual just like punk characters and we're like, yeah, film these people who are making this film just like participating in these insanely violent <laughs> demonstrations. And like that, like tanks are rolling right by the cameras, like cars are on fire everywhere. People are just like demolishing things like it is a full on disruption of civilized society that's taking place 
in the real world. Meanwhile, you have like the guys in the boardroom doing this incredible 360 degree shot in the center of their boardroom where they're all going like, hmm, did you hear that Kennedy got assassinated? Oh, that's not good. Oh, no. who are these punks who are disturbing our burger <laughs> restaurant? <laughs> Jaeger, can you please? We don't like their faces. Please, <laughs> please. It, it just... kind of makes me think of like, it's 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 kind of like a like a like a testament to what people can do if they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Like, they're, yeah. they're, like yes. it's, it's pretty clear that like they had just some like people revolt. involved in this. Exactly. Like some people had some idea of how to make a film and other people are clearly just like, let's just do some stuff. Like what would be interesting? Well, maybe if the camera spun around, that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and so they just kind of do everything with what they have at hand where it's like well let's film a riot and let's uh let's you know we have colored lights and that's all the that's the only special effects that we have so let's shine <laughs> them really brightly on absolutely everything in the film <laughs> i mean they do a pretty good job making it they do feel like a like a visually dense film like considering the circumstances that they would have been filming this under yeah like, like when it, it, like fm is working on his his music in his in his office uh when there's actually a stationary shot at at least it's usually on like a Dutch angle and it feels as if his, you know, his, his mind is kind of like he, he's, he's focused on his work, but it's also he, he, what he's trying to do is, is cause chaos and, and revolt. So there's this kind of like uh, this stilted image of it, which I really liked. Well, it, yeah, I like that, that, that shot of him like squeezing the frog into <laughs> oh, the microphone yeah. as well to like oh, get like more of a sound going. Yeah. yeah it's well, screaming and, and, into the microphone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and like it, in in contrast to uh, New Rose Hotel, all the every space is like just absolutely cluttered with like trash and like wires and like all this other stuff. Like it's very yeah, it's not mundane and empty. No. This, like this is like a very populated. I mean, yeah. even though it still can be like you know disgusting and run down, but like it, it is in like a very real like decayed sense. Yeah, where well, you can act, you you see every texture of a building. You know, very clearly in collapse or like when you see Jaeger ascending that staircase. And it's oh, like yeah. all in purple as yeah. he's about to like chase him through the brick rooftop and stuff like it's like it, it's visually still, uh, you know, very, very uh, intense and expressive. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and, and that's where the, the, the texture of the I, I think 16 millimeter film really works for in their favor because it, it really lends like a grainy um, like texture to the film to the image itself on top of all mm -hmm. the like you know garbage and everything like that the you know all like the the detritus of like post industrialization uttering every single space yeah to that point about like the detritus uh it, the one of the strongest um images in the film i feel like is when um it's it's not i, I guess it's a dream but i'm not sure who's having it exactly where i i think fm is dreaming about christiana in this in that that like weird toxic landfill wearing mm. like a space blanket like like a reflective space <laughs> blanket and it's kind of like wrapped in it looking very strangely angelic as a figure is approaching i i think that's jaeger because he later refers to like a dream where he's walking along the road he sees an object on the road i think that's it um mm. and then they kind of like walk off together into again this weird vacant trash filled landscape it kind of reminded me which then of, cuts away to someone watching it on a tv like yes, you see that same yeah, shot on a yeah. tv like there's so many screens and like like the, again like the screen booths and there's also the part two in the very beginning which i didn't mention when he's looking at all the information and he actually has fm's face like projected on mm -hmm. yaker's face like just straight oh, yeah. up, like just, you know, like like there's so much um, of the distance being closed between these people by this technology and also um, the, the film, the final shot of the film, spoiler alert, is uh, TV screens as well. Yeah, some of yep. some of that 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 image reminded me kind of of like uh, the Nicholas Rogue film Walkabout, which I don't I don't remember if the podcast has has covered, but it no, has I, I haven't seen that one. It's oh, it's 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 not as good as some of the other like Australian new wave stuff, but it does have some really interesting depictions of poetic desolation, which I think is very applicable uh, to this film. In, in particular, that 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 shot there, um, mm. it just has that sense of like I don't know, just like a, a a blasted emptiness filled with trash, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, like, that's definitely like the atmosphere you end up kind of pulling from this. Like so much of this film is just watching like people aimlessly walk around this setting. Like I, just, I love that one shot and I think it's fucking beautiful of just that shot of FM. It's a like like a, a side scrolling dolly shot of him just walking ar- oh, yeah. around as he sees like posters and like buildings mm-hmm. and everything looks like it's been written on or like it has broken windows and the doors have been torn off due to, you know, you can kind of presume some of the rioting that we've seen where you have the armored vehicles and the shields and the gas and, you know, everyone kind of like freaking out. And yeah, there's just like to see the chaos in the moment and how exciting it is. And then to see just like this wandering aftermath. I mean, I don't think it's quite the same, but I was reminded of, we talked about with uh, Perry Rowland this year, Workmeister Harmonies, which was Mm -hmm. a film where so much of that film in terms of how Bellatar obviously is patient with it is like literally just like five minute tracking shots of like, people walking through a desolate location at a certain point people just not even talking to each other it's just like complete silence amongst you know i don't know i don't know if you call them friends but yeah Yeah. (laughs) but yeah for for like an 85 minute like cyberpunk counterculture thing i was just kind of surprised to see you know like you know to just make such effective use of one the location one the 16 millimeter uh you know uh, film and the texture and everything of it and yeah for it to you know actually give it a sense of you know to give it i think the loneliness that it wants and the desolation that it's looking for in in terms of you know what these characters are i guess whether coherently or not they're raging against something they feel something's wrong mm-hmm. even if they don't know exactly what it is and that's why he just knows that something needs to be disrupted something needs to be broken and undone and yeah that's ultimately what fuels the like the entire thing like jaeger is pursuing him to be like this guy is just fucking with shit and we don't know exactly <laughs> why and we don't know who he is but we just have to take him down and it ends in a big like climactic you know, chase sequence that you would see in, you know, kind of like a noir story where like literally there's like a rooftop chase and there is like, you know, him and it it, it does have this big moment too where Jaeger is like stalking Christiana in order to get to him. And then there's this big romantic embrace between FM and uh, Christiana. And it's, it's shot from what I could tell it's shot twice like two di- like it, it, it almost looked like they shot it at two different times and they cross cut between them as they embrace and spin each other around mm. and it's so amazing watching Jaeger who we know has been kind of yearning for something a little bit more sort of like X that he's been looking for he's been going to the peep show he's been interested in the women he's been like there there is got to be something beyond this lifestyle that I currently live and he seals real human connection between these two and he's so distracted by it that he's brutally run over by a car <laughs> <laughs> so did did you think that he successfully kills uh them because i kind of think that maybe he did because right before you see him get hit by a car they cut back to the kind of computer nerd guy and there's a message on screen that says like destruction confirmed and i and, and, and smiles, you never I see too yeah, and you never see FM and Christiana after that point, except okay. in that 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 like spinning embrace, like that you spinning don't, you don't shot see the in the shot. It's from together, a surveillance right? camera, it seems. So it almost could be like you know, ten minutes prior when they were embracing or something like that. Yeah, I, I, that's yeah, possible. It doesn't, yeah, it see, doesn't my, really give closure to those characters. It, it, so it definitely like, doesn't yeah. really give closure. But weirdly enough, my interpretation was that the assistant betrayed him. Oh, yeah, interesting. I, and that and that and that he was trying to target his boss to target Jaeger because he realized that Jaeger had kind of gone off script and was like doing his own things. And beca- just because of the last meeting with the boss right, where I they said that, say, yeah. you know, you used to be better and we're going to get rid of you if you don't like, you know, start doing better. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have him get hit by the car and you do get the thing on the thing that says like target down and you get his assistant kind of smirking. So but my immediate inter- interpretation was just that he was betrayed by his own institution and they went, wow. fuck this guy. We're done I, with him. I, I do love how many times they show his corpse with like the blood coming out of the mouth. Cause you could, yes. tell, that, you could tell that they were really pleased with like the makeup job that they did. Cause they show it like 20 times. In a row. <laughs> there's, a, there, there, there's a few spots of the film where you get that kind of like exuberance of like newish, not quite amateur, but maybe a little bit of amateur filmmakers where like they know that they did something well. And so they, and so they, they show it a whole bunch cause they want to make yeah. sure you see it. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. definitely one of them they're like we're a real movie check it out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and I guess got Jagger a guy in that meeting with the boss too does say something. I think he tells him he's like, "You fucking disgust me." So it, it yeah. feels <laughs> as if he's. I mean, you know, you don't want to say he's turned over a new leaf or anything that extreme, <laughs> but there, there's definitely something inside him that has completely gotten cold to even the job that he's been doing and doing so well for so long. So yeah, it, it, I could I could see both interpretations, uh, but I, I think initially I. I I saw the um, the institution betraying him as well, but I, I do like that thought. I really do because it, it kind of it becomes subjective just because you're looking at their embrace through the surveillance and through the screen. So it, it, it is a great feel final shot real. that the credits run over. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, because because yeah it is the same screens that he used to watch on and spy on people and also watch his movies and I love that shot of all the eyes on the TV screen that he sees at one point mm-hmm. and you know there's you know and and yeah having just the four screens there and having him in the corner dying having them in the other corner doing their spinning embrace that it's almost been sort of immortalized by the by the the footage of it mm-hmm. and then you have the still the just general chaos and you know sort of riots and destruction that are still taking place on the other two screens and you just have all four of these things taking place simultaneously which is you know what the film was kind of trying to depict that all of this exists at the same time and you kind of are navigating it all at once and it is kind of this surreal like experience that you're like you know how do you make choices within that um yeah and yeah it's it's a really really cool film and i was glad that we finally uh that i finally it's been on my radar for a while ever since vinegar syndrome put the blu-ray out so i was glad to finally Mm. get a chance to actually uh check it out but uh it's a nice flip side to um, to New Rose Hotel, which is so like anti focusing on technology. Whereas, like again, although the like although the manifestations of technology in this film probably seem quaint now, like it's very fixated on what technology looks like, how technology colors our experiences. Like so yeah, much of the makes film intentionally feel. evokes surveillance. Yeah, go ahead. Oh no, that I was just that, just how it how it kind of it makes us feel. Like I, I feel mm-hmm. as if his his access to sound and what he seems to be good at even prior to um you know discovering that he can cause a revolution um it it it, it feels it, he he finds power in it in a sense even though he doesn't exactly know what well to, yeah the, to i mean with that's that that's why for me it, it would be called decoder it's like it's the guy who figures out how to make to reverse the technology to make it work in his favor versus you know being used against him as yeah. a tool that makes him paranoid and freaky right like it's yeah. just you know it, it feels like the guy who breaks the code and is like uh, we can turn this against the fascist institution we can weaponize this and yeah it's definitely it's it's a dude who fundamentally is interested in the you know the the knobs like how the devices actually do the thing like there are like the actual music creation sequences are really really cool and just watching him record things and remix them and figure them out and (laughs) that one sequence where he just like starts shoving shit onto his face and mouth while like dancing to his own music and then being like now it's time now we can do a terrorism at the mcdonald's with this it's my (laughs) masterpiece is fucking ready there's a really cool shot where he's like he's manually splicing uh magnetic tape together um he's doing like actual manual sound editing which like uh, again i wonder if someone who's like in their 20s would even recognize what that is but that's that's what that is is he's actually like he's he's doing actual analog you know audio editing um, by yeah. like you know f- he's got like all the different bits and pieces of tape kind of like sliced up and he's got them stuck onto like a little board and he's trying to piece them back together um, yeah I, I, I love that and that idea of like you live in a world ruled by technology but technology is a tool that you too can can grasp onto and use to fight back is such a foundational cyberpunk concept like mm-hmm. that's straight up William Gibson even though like this is Burroughs like that's where I think this really goes side by side with with like cyberpunk and it's it like it can't be anything else it's such a like okay if the world is defined by technology and i have access to it too then that means that like in some on some level i'm on equal footing with these massive governments with these massive you know fast food chains like i can literally use their technology against them i can fight them i can fight back on the same you know leveling playing field that they're fighting me on right i i, I love that in this film 
yeah, yeah me too yeah for sure yeah it's awesome yeah and maybe i think pivoting towards a reductive rating round on decoder this was a very solid maybe even a strong four for me i think i want to give it another watch because i was yeah. definitely in the early goings i was like taken aback at just what <laughs> i was too. looking at and, <laughs> you know and all the frogs baby <laughs> yeah and just you know every, like there was so much bizarre detail to it and 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 shocking detail too like just the sudden images of necrophilia and like mutilation and the constant hum of tvs just always playing horrific like archival news footage and just really graphic stuff but then mixing that in with this very lo-fi you know cyberpunk very neon drenched new wave you know sort of apocalypse kind of stuff that it that it was going for and then mixing it with some of the sensibilities that i was a little bit more familiar with like the fact that the peep show i was thinking about crimes of passion the mcdonald's honestly it has the best nighttime mcdonald's stuff <laughs> since like what like fallen <laughs> angels i was thinking of Wong Kar Wai a little bit um <laughs> You know, uh, Videodrome a little bit with some of the texture and, you know, and then, you know, and then obviously just because we did it, I was obviously thinking about Liquid Sky and the the countercultural, transgressive, revolutionary kind of qualities of it. But yeah, just this is a very like underseen and, you know, really cool piece of lo-fi cyberpunk and like the, the, the abandoned, decaying location work of Germany that they use, the disgusting, greasy fast food photography they do of those people eating uh, you know screaming frogs that are uh, g- going to be trained to be cr- castrating assassins you know <laughs> like it's just it's 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 pretty incredibly again just very visually dense stuff considering that this was just a bunch of countercultural artist weirdos who had you know, no idea probably what it was that they were doing, or, you know, maybe a couple members had some idea and they were like formally, how do we just make this as weird and expressive of our, you know, you know, our, our feelings of angst and alienation that we are experiencing in the actual world. And how do you actually get that across through the filmmaking? I think they did a pretty good job. And I mean, the fact that, you know, every single one of these characters comes away with like a bizarre world and personality you imagine existing outside of their scene. And that, you know, you get these moments of just handing real punkers fucking ca- super eight cameras and saying, go film actual protests and violent, you know, uh, uh, demonstrations. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it has an effect like it, it has a cumul- an accumulative effect. I found that all of these different things that feel like they shouldn't make sense together do actually paint a portrait of a world that doesn't make sense pretty effectively. Um, and yeah, William S. Burroughs is in, like actually in the film, like makes mm-hmm. a cameo. It's just the old guy fiddling with a tape deck and the hairstyles are fucking amazing as well. Just by the way, just total <laughs> oh, aside, yeah. completely unrelated to everything. <laughs> oh, I love yeah. seeing all of these bizarre outfits that they have on. Y- y- Jaeger's uh, like assistant guy. He has that like curly mop in the front of his hair. He looks like a mm-hmm. zoomer TikTok. Like he looks yeah. like, like, it looks yeah. like yeah. the same actor. Honestly, <laughs> I don't know if they played both parts, but um, it lo- they, they look similar. Yeah, no, no cap for real, for real. Uh, yeah. Christian, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, those frogs are busted, respectfully. Uh, yes. <laughs> Christiana's haircut is so cool. And yes. literally, like, she literally just looks like someone from, like, 2022. Yeah, that's she, true. If, if you saw her on TikTok now, you'd be like, "Yeah, that's that, that's reasonable." Um, yeah. Also, then, now I want to go find out about her life being a fourteen-year-old heroin addict or whatever. Like, now I got to go find about out about all that too. Yeah. Like, she like all of the every single person who appears in this seems like a genuine, amazing artist and weirdo. And yeah. you know, you you get that through the film. Like, you get this weird amalgamation of all of these different, you know, sort of neon new wave counterculture paranoid you know freaks just merging all of their sensibilities together yeah. you know yeah. through through the colors and the noise and everything so had a had a, a a blast with it so very very solid four for me yeah i'm also gonna give it a four and yeah just speaking on the performances it does feel like uh, like a bunch of people that just kind of understand um these these characters almost because like in a sense i think it's what they're truly feeling like they're it's obviously not your conventional actors doing this but 
there, there's something they just kind of let themselves go and create and it feels very natural oddly enough um and i just love the focus on sound and technology i mean i i any movie i love when they have a focus on the the actual technical craft of something and they you know so watching him fuck with the equalizers making this revolutionary music is it's just great and and the thought of you know taking the lounge music that you'd hear in a in a restaurant and being like let's do industrial metal and make everybody revolt against <laughs> the government and corporations is just such an awesome <laughs> thought um so yeah i i really enjoyed it and there's a, and honestly there's a lot of like uh that they they did a lot of experimentation with this i like all the lighting i like that there's some really cool tracking shots that we talked about there's there's strangely enough for people that you know I guess we're just you know kind of giving cameras and like shoot what you feel it feels still very well put together and and I'm kind of shocked by it honestly it's it's a it's a great film so yeah f- uh, four out of five for me I I really enjoyed it yeah it's yeah, I- uh, it's definitely a four out of five for me as well I think if, if I have a criticism is that there's a couple scenes later in the film where they're definitely trying to actually get like to some plot and like <laughs> get a little bit of actual dialogue scenes and they just don't work as well as the more chaotic, like more naturalistic scenes. Yeah. Um, because like when you like uh, apart from like Bill Rice, like who, who plays Jaeger, like they're just they're their abilities as actors is to basically be who they are in mm-hmm. real life. And when you ask them mm-hmm. to deliver actual lines, like it, it, it does get a little bit, it, it gets a little bit clunky. And some of the scenes I think could honestly could have just like been cut and wouldn't have, have influenced. Yeah, the Not more I, natural feeling is when he's putting food on his face and dancing to his own music. Exactly, it feels yeah, like he did exactly. that in his own room many times, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Like I, I think the genius of this film is that, like, the the strength of it is that they realized that they were living in a moment that embodied what they wanted to make art about. That this yeah. idea of like the modern world coming into being, and this idea of like informational surveillance coming into being, and and this this sense of you know modernity, it's like asserting itself on the field of of history where you still have the, like the, the wreckage and the remnants of world war two. And now you've got kind of modern technology moving in. And I, I think, I think it's just like, it, it, it's just very well observed of them to be like, we need to make a film about this and use it as the backdrop. And like, it's, it's clear that they, they, they don't need, you know, big matte paintings or big, you know, like effects shots mm-hmm. because that was the world that they were living in. And all it took was to capture it and to put like a little bit of like a very slightly sci-fi uh, spin on it. Um, and to put like a little bit more focus on the, you know, the strangeness of the technology that while everyone else was celebrating it, they had maybe a little bit more skepticism too. And I, I, I think it's just like a really genius move uh to to capture that and so yeah it's a it's definitely it's like a strong four out of five uh for for me and you know again the performances are 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 good even not graded on a curve and i think if you grade Mm -hmm. them in terms of like the experience the actors had are i would say extremely good or at least extremely well edited to capture the good parts yeah definitely i i also am going with a four out of five um, I, I love movies, uh, especially like fiction, uh, narrative movies that are that kind of like capture a scene, like stuff that like anything from like the Warhol, like Cadre or, or um, you know, like uh, uh, Penelope Spheris uh, uh, Suburbia, which cap- really captures like L.A., uh, early, you know, late 70s, early 80s punk scenes. Um, and this one is like the same thing where it's like this this scene of, you know, musicians and and writers and, and just uh you know just general countercultural people coming together to to make this i i, I really love how it, it, it you know sets sets in uh you know permanent uh puts in permanent uh like this capture that captures that moment I, yeah um but i also think it, it does a good job of like um, conveying a lot of the ideas of cyberpunk, like we've all kind of been teasing out. Um, particularly, I liked um, how everything is mediated. There's screens everywhere. Uh, at one point, FM and Christiana are in the same room, but they're oh, talking yes. to each other through the phone <laughs> with, with blindfolds on. Uh, blindfolds on, and I so I, I just thought that was like a perfect uh, you know idea for that. Like it's it's just that I, whole idea. Um, or or the shots of them framed out of focus, like through wet glass at times yeah. too. Like yeah. it's just yeah, yeah, completely disorienting yes, at times. Exactly. Yeah, 
and and uh, I, I really liked how um, you know it, it's just leaned leaned into using the the West German um, architecture and still you know still uh, you know forty years on still rebuilding after World War II, uh, and uh, just every just everything about it. Yeah, it, it's just like a perfect cyberpunk movie. Um, you know, I, I really can't think of one that would have uh, you know gotten all those themes and uh, images and aesthetics better than this. The, the yeah. only and done it that, on like what has to be like no money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I can think to compare this film to is uh, something like the Japanese film Burst City, which is oh, this yeah. kind of like proto cyberpunk that. punk rock. Like it's a film that was about, actually like, that was that was in consideration for our Blade Runner pairing because it was 1982 as well. And I was like, very 1982 weird film. Yeah. Very weird <laughs> film. Very yeah. different from what I expected it to be. But that's the only thing I can, I can compare it to where it's like, they just went and captured a scene and they're like, wow, this feels like science fiction straight up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna have to check it out. Uh, but yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up uh, for this week. That was new Rose hotel from 1998. And, uh, why am I decoder from 1984? <laughs> the thanks frogs so got you, man. The frogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Kurt and Chris for joining us on this episode and for bringing these films with you. Uh, if you guys have anything to plug while you're here, this is usually where we have you do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, Chris and I can be heard regularly, uh, very regularly on Podside picnic, which is a, uh, a leftist podcast about the literature of the fantastic, be that sci-fi, horror or fantasy um we recently did oh gosh what did we do recently we've we've been doing robot a jocks. year oh yes yes robot jocks yeah there's a great there's a great one um Stuart yeah, Gordon. We, yeah yep yep we do that, we that, do movie, that movie's that movie's a lot of fun for anyone oh who hasn't God. seen it it rocks i was it, really it, it's, like, it's like it. it's like Stuart gordon the guy who made reanimator like what if he got a chance to do like a saturday morning <laughs> power rangers like style thing it's incredible it, it kicks ass yeah it prefigures so much of pacific rim too Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Ahead, and, and yeah, oh, no, I was just saying, yeah. So, so we do, we do books, we do comics, we do movies, we do video games, um, pretty much anything sci-fi fantasy and, and horror. And we definitely have more of a focus on, I, I would say stuff from like the sixties through the nineties, but we also do a fair bit of more recent stuff too. Uh, we did the, uh, John Langan book, uh, the fisherman, uh, recently too, which was, which was terrific, terrific piece of, uh, horror fiction. So you can find us over there. Um, we also do parents just don't understand. which is a podcast, uh, about children's media. Um, that's been on hiatus for, I'd say about a year now, but we'll probably do some more stuff in the relatively near future. You never know. Um, and uh, we do just kind of all different types of children's films, um, and we kind of take an analysis of it as in terms of both like how a child would experience it and how you would experience it as a parent and what it can teach kids, and also some of the kind of underlying political ideology of it. Uh, I'm going to recommend an episode of that that we did on Captain Planet uh, with the fine people at uh, Hit Factory, uh, Carly and Aaron, where we went really deep on the ideology of Captain Planet for like two hours. Um, that was a good time. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I have a magazine called Blood Knife, um, which is at bloodknife.com. And we do uh, leftist socialist analysis of all different forms of media, written, musical, game, film. Uh, and uh, that's at bloodknife.com. And you can support us if you would like at patreon.com slash bloodknife. Oh, yeah, I can definitely recommend checking out all three of those. Everyone should go. Jamie and I both, we guested on one. I guessed it on the parents at one point. And Blood Knife, not yet, but we would love to collaborate at some point. Oh, yes, Blood Knife definitely. Is very cool. Um, so go check it out. Uh, for our listeners, we are going to be back in one week's time where uh, we're going to be sticking in the sci-fi realm, but we're heading on over to Japan, and we are going back, as Jamie hinted at, to uh, <laughs> visit our good old friend, Mr. Godzilla. We're yeah. going to go see yeah. what, the big, what the big boy is up to, and we're sticking around in the Showa era. We're actually going to do, because uh, I watched in early in the pandemic, I watched the entire Showa era Criterion uh, book that I have, and I kind of wanted to pick two kind of of the weirder B-sides that I don't see get necessarily the most attention one of them i think gets more attention than the other but we're going to be talking right. about one abira horror of the deep oh we're, yeah. so we're going to be talking about godzilla taking on a big old crustacean going red lobster <laughs> mode on some guy's ass 
<laughs> and it's also probably the most overtly sort of like cartoony and childishy uh, other than maybe I guess like son of Godzilla where they start introducing Manila and <laughs> so I definitely wanted to get Jamie watching the uh you know, like get us even more childish than even just the monster bash em ups <laughs> that we've already done, like uh, like Ghidorah, uh, which still has like some, you know, some pretty serious sci fi plotting to it. Like Abira is like designed to be in- engaged with and understood by children. And then we're going to be talking about uh, Godzilla versus Hadora, which is just my personal favorite oh uh, Showa era sequel and basically combines the idea that the movie should have been colorful and aimed at children and somehow makes teaches children about pollution and environmental destruction and, and basically it makes it your body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's probably the closest to being genuinely apocalyptic and political since the original Godzilla film, uh, just completely yeah. by while also still being a pretty fun monster and vis- like visually inventive monster movie where like, how do you fight a giant sludge tadpole? Like logistically. <laughs> so like, we're going to talk Showa era Godzilla. That's Speaking next week frogs. over on the Patreon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then in uh, two weeks time, the reason we, we're kind of doing that episode is it sets up for, we have a guest who wants to bring on destroy all monsters. Hell yeah. Uh, Can't which wait. is kind of like the, the probably like the ultimate culmination of all of the monsters, uh, you know, uh, characters that were introduced and Honda uh, at coming back after taking a break from making Godzilla films for a while. So we're going to talk about that. And the pairing with that film is a film I've never seen. And I don't know if I completely understand the pairing yet, but the <laughs> guest swears that this makes sense. We're going to be talking about the Giver. Mm. Uh, directed by Steve Wang and Screaming Mad George, the effects artist who did all of the effects for uh, Society. Oh, hell um, yeah. And The Giver, I think it's a Canadian film, and I think Mark Hamill is in it. <laughs> Sick. So, no I get, idea I get what it. to do. I get it. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I can't it, it literally could it. just be monster suits. Um, that literally <laughs> might just be it. Um, but regardless, that is what we're going to be talking about in uh, two weeks time over on the main feed. So look forward to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that being said, I think that wraps it up for everything. Thanks so much for listening and keep us easy. Keep us easy.